This is going to be lecture number one for American History One. Uh, the title of the lecture is When Worlds Collide, North America versus European Culture. I want to go through and discuss the two different areas of the world that are going to merge together after 1492. Neither side knew the other existed until 1492. And so it's best to separate them and discuss each culture separate, differently and then bring them together as one group here. And uh, you're going to see a major change take place uh, when all these countries emerge together and form <clears throat> what would become the United States. I want to start off this discussion by discussing actual the culture, the term culture, and what it means. The culture begins with the family. The family grouping is where culture actually began, and culture expanded as families merged together through marriage, through communities, through churches, through political actions, people come together to form their own communities. And you guys are part of many communities, uh, uh, different groups of people and different events that you attend and so forth. So culture is, is, is a term we use to try to explain or try to look into how people live and, and what is their actual agenda uh, in, the, in this time period, in these early years of the United States. I want you guys to also consider that a major part of, of culture is going to be what you actually experience in culture. Things like storytelling, music, family history, oral traditions, which is part of storytelling. You're going to have dance. You're going to have art. You're going to have politics, education. You're also going to have uh, the economy. Some people excel in the economy. Some folks don't do so well in the economy. So we're gonna look at various different elements here of, of culture in this class. When I was going to school at Ole Miss, I learned the importance of studying cultural history. Cultural history gives you more background, more insightful information than you get from a regular history class. We're not just gonna do dates and presidents and try to memorize the constitution and all this kind of stuff. We're gonna actually look at how people evolve, or how people live and their reaction to their lives and, and how they try to uh, excel in their lives. And so I want you guys to start off the class by doing one easy assignment. I'm not gonna grade you on this assignment. It's just something I want you guys to do. I want you to go and talk to your grandparents, to your grandma and your grandpa. And I want you to ask them how they met each other, how they came together and formed their family. If you have a great grandmother or a great grandfather who's still alive, talk to them. Anybody over the age of 60 in your family, I want you to talk to them and get, and get their story because their story is your story. You guys don't realize it, but y'all have been around here on, on, in the world over 250,000 years. Your DNA is that old. And so one of your assignments or that you could do, and I think it'd be very interesting, especially with Christmas time coming and you're trying to buy gifts for people, is to get a DNA test and give it to your grandfather or to your grandmother. The grandfather would be best because there's more information on his DNA than there'll be on grandmother's DNA. We have not really perfected the DNA for the ladies yet. We're still working on it, but it's not quite there yet. So think about doing a DNA test, especially for an older person in your family, and, and start getting the history together that is based on that DNA. And I think you'll enjoy it. You can also start doing genealogy to study your family history. That's a part of the history program. And that gives you all kinds of details about your family, where they live, what they did for a living. And starting in 1850, the federal census tells you about everybody in the family, their age when they were born, the occupation, they go into school or not. There's a lot of interesting information in the 1850 federal census. So what you need to do is work backwards. The most recent census is the 1940 census. So you need to know who your great-grandparents were and then find out where they lived and go to the 1940 census. 
And you can follow it backward to the 1930 census, the 1920 census, the 1910 census, the 1900 census, and on back to the 18, 1880 census. Don't worry about the 1890, it's not there. They lost that one. On back to 1850. And that gives you over 150 years of family history and or, or more. And so you'll have a lot to work with here, guys, and a lot of, a lot of fun trying to figure all this stuff out. And family history is a very important part of your life. And I would definitely do it. You're probably going to be lucky and you're going to find an aunt or an uncle or a family relative who's already done or who's already written down a family history. And most people who did all this stuff usually had it put into a notebook. And you probably get a copy of the notebook that they put together. Some people published a book on their family history. But I think you'll have a, a, a good time doing all this stuff. If you need any help do, starting off your family history, just come see me for class or call me or text me and I will be able to help you get started. And it's all gonna be free because there's all kinds of websites that gives you information that are free. So don't pay for anything, guys. Uh, try to find the free stuff because it's out there, okay? All right, so guys, Cultural history is what we're going to do in this class. We're going to look at how people evolve through their cultural experiences. And I want to start off by discussing the people who come to North America. I want you to realize that we had three great ice ages that took place on Earth. We're not sure if meteors caused the ice ages. It could have been done by volcanoes. There's various ways to have ice ages, have the Earth cool down. People today are concerned about global warming we have three or four big earthquakes out in Java like we had in 1816, and global warming is a history. It's gone because the Earth's going to cool down because of volcanoes. And this is what happened here, guys, some 40,000 years ago. We had this great ice age appear. Human beings all began their lives, began their existence in East Africa. We all have our roots back toward Eastern Africa. This is Ethiopia a part of the world, okay? During the Great Ice Age, or before the Great Ice Age, people started migrating. They started going northward. They went from West Africa, or East Africa rather, into what is now the Middle East. A lot of them went toward Lebanon. They went on up toward Kazakhstan. This is up here on the, uh, this is up on the Black Sea area. It's also on the Caspian Sea area. This is where the history of the Great Flood took place. The Great Flood affected everybody because there's in, was in one place up here, or there's a large number of us in one place up here during that time period. So that's why everybody has a flood story in their, in their history. From Kazakhstan is where the Ice Age began for us, for humans. And we realized we've got to feed ourselves. Food is the most important commodity that people have to deal with. You've got to have food to feed the people. You run out of food, you got major problems on hand, major problems to deal with, okay? So here in Kazakhstan, the people began to move looking for new food sources. Some folks went down toward India. Some folks went down toward China and down into what is now Vietnam. They made their way into Malaysia and walked the islands, which would all land connected during the Ice Age, to Australia. You had a lot of people who are going to walk out toward China and then make their way up toward Mongolia and make their way into Siberia looking for food. You'll have people who will leave and will go, will go northward toward Scandinavia and, and live in that part of the world during the Ice Age. And then you'll have folks who will go over to the peninsula of Europe. So this great Ice Age occurs and people are trying to feed themselves. We have got probably close to a million people in the world at this time period. I want you to remember also, folks, that a lot of people remained in Africa. Some did not leave Africa. That was home to them. They did not leave it. So you start seeing people spread all across Europe during this time period. Now, another little thing I want you guys to realize, we also have the, um, the people who call themselves Neanderthals. Neanderthals were, were, were of a human genome, but were not quite homo sapiens. And they were around during this time period. And a lot of you guys who do DNA are going to find Neanderthal in your, in your DNA. I have it in mind. Uh, I'm 2% Neanderthal. 
If you're more than 3% Neanderthal, you usually have a hairier body than most people would. You'd have hair on your back, hair on your chest, real hairy arms and legs and so forth. And that was, that's a sign of being part Neanderthal uh, or having a higher percentage of Neanderthal in your, in, your, uh, in your lineage, in your DNA a lineage. So these folks begin to spread out trying to eat, trying to find food sources, okay? And remember, guys, that in the Ice Age, you had large land animals that are moving around. They're migrating during this time period. And so people have a chance to actually find plenty of food sources, plenty of protein from the large animals. We had, we had the bison. We had the woolly mammoths. Uh, we, had, we had camels and horses. These animals were mostly living on that ice bridge between, between Alaska and Russia, the Barren, the Barren Sea area of today. And these folks up here had a great supply of food. Of course, the bison, the woolly mammoths, and so forth, the reindeer, the larger animals, will also be in Europe. So you'll see a lot of people who are surviving off the animals they encounter in this time period. The hunting of animals is going to be the very beginning of human technology. You're going to have to find ways and devices to go and trap these animals in order to slaughter these animals for consumption. And so your early technology is going to be centered around animals. Don't you guys remember that? The Europeans are going to adopt the horse. The horse becomes a major part of their society after the Ice Age. North America does not have a horse. We do not have a camel. Oh, they started here and they migrated across that land bridge. They mostly gathered up in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, the mountains of Asia, of Central Asia, and here they started evolving. They started getting bigger and, and larger and, and stronger and so forth. We lost our animals. When the earth warmed up, those animals went away. We don't have the horse or the camel. So the people of North America do not have any, they do not have any uh, source of a draft animal. So their technology is going to stay pretty much stagnant. The people of Europe have a horse, which means they'll develop a wheel, they'll develop a wagon, they're going to have plow lines and plows and various different kinds of technology centered around farming, trying to feed themselves, okay? Well, the people of Siberia are gonna make their way north during this ice age, and they come across this large land bridge. We believe that 250,000 people originally were the original group who came to the new world, 250,000 people. They spent 20,000 years living in an ice age. The people of Europe lived 20,000 years in an ice age, okay? It's a long period of time. There's over 200 generations here, guys, that were living in this ice age. So a lot of, a lot of time spent here uh, being, being living in cold weather. These folks who came across the Barren Straits, the ones who came across the Barren Straits into, into what is now Alaska, they're going to come in here, guys, living off of whatever they can find. The bison and the woolly mammoth is their major survival. That is the animal they have to have for survival. Once they kill a woolly mammoth, they're going to take the skin off that woolly mammal, and that skin will be used to make clothing and shoes and hats and jackets. The, 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 uh, the hides off these animals will be used to make tents. The bones will be used to make the stakes to hold the, the tents up. They'll make tools out of the bones. They'll use the bones as weapons here. Some guys are gonna carve the bones. These are your first artisans, guys. They're the ones who are gonna carve the bones, carve the, carve the ivory, and they're gonna make utensils to eat with. They'll make tools to hunt with. They'll, they'll do various different things with, uh, with the bones that they, they find uh, from these animals uh, uh, in this time period. So the animals, the big bisons were very, very important to the people here in this ice age. Even the fuel they used came from the woolly mammoths, came from the bison, came from the animals they hunted. They used the dung of these animals to heat the, to heat them, to heat up their, their cook their cook areas. They also are going to have these big uh, these, these areas also for warmth. 
So these animals are very important, guys, to the survival of these folks here, okay? Now, another thing for you guys to realize, not only did they not have a draft animal, when they came across the Bering Straits here during this ice age, you're going to start seeing people not getting sick. Those diseases of Europe will leave the human body from living in the cold. After 20,000, 25,000 years of living in the ice age, these people do not have any diseases they carry with them. When they do come into the new world and they start settling and the ice age starts, starts receding, going backwards toward the north, you're gonna start seeing a problem with mosquitoes. You'll have a problem with malaria and with yellow fever. That's the only two, only two diseases that really affects the Native Americans in this time. <coughs> So they do not have European diseases at all, okay? These folks are, are totally immune to anything out of Europe, which is gonna be a major problem when Columbus and those Europeans, those Spaniards show up in Mesoamerica. It's gonna be a major problem for these folks here, okay? So you kind of see what's going on here with these folks here. They live over 25,000 years, in some cases during the Ice Age. You know, today's world, we're discussing a new homeland, a new planet to go to. We realize that eventually we're going to ruin our planet. There'll be nothing but pollution. People will be dying from pandemics. It's gonna be major problems here in our world. And we're gonna to have to go to a new area of, of the universe to live, to find a new planet to live on. Well. NASA and our and our space folks have been very busy and they have been discovering various suitable planets to go to in the future. The only problem is we've got to build some spacecraft that's going to be extremely expensive and extremely big. I mean, you're going to talk about space camp, space, uh, spaceships that's going to be four or five miles along or across. It's going to be major areas here with multi-decks on these on these ships down on these ships to get these people to the new homeland and we realize that plants will grow in space we tried all this out in the apollo missions way back in the 1960s the space station is growing plants and so therefore we realize our food supply will go with us across the universe our closest and habitable planet is 25,000 years away. It'll be just like going through a new ice age to get there. And you'll see thousands of generations, hundreds of generations that will be evolving on spaceships going to a new homeland. Some folks will never have their feet set on solid ground. They'll be in space our entire lives, generation after generation after generation. But we will make it and we will do it here. We did it. In the, we did it, and we did it in the past. So we're looking at all this future stuff while we study history. And I love playing connections. This caused this. That caused this to happen. If this did not happen, then this would not have happened. And we're going to do a lot of that in the class. Compare, comparing what what items uh, line up with each other, and uh, and how uh, various situations and various policies change because of the way we we. Uh, had them uh, lined up and, and had them connect with each other uh, in this time period, okay? Around 10,000 years ago, the ice began to melt. Here in North America, the large glaciers went as far south as the Ohio, as the Ohio Valley. If you go across the, the Missouri River and just keep on going through Missouri, the state of Missouri, and down through Kansas, and on over to Colorado, and on into Nevada, and on into California, you'll see where the ice came to. So the areas around Virginia, Pennsylvania, everything northward was covered in ice, these big, huge ice sheets. These big ice sheets is what created the Rocky Mountains. They created the Great Lakes. They created a lot of the formations that you see here, a lot of the uh, uh, landscape that you see here in North America, okay? It all goes back to the Ice Age, uh, some, some uh, like I said, some 15, 20,000 years ago. When the ice receded, people started moving southward, all right? Now, most of the folks that came across the Barren Straits are gonna go along the coastline. 
that's the easiest way to travel. You can leave, you can leave out there, you can come into the Aleutian Islands during this ice age and up in, up in Northwest Alaska and make your way down the coastline. Come on down where Juneau is today. Come on down where, where Vancouver and Seattle are today, San Francisco. Once you get past San Francisco, they started losing the ice sheets. And these folks kept on traveling. They went on down toward Los Angeles of today. They went down to the Baja of today. They made their way to Mexico of today. And these folks went all the way down to Chile and Argentina and Brazil. When they started going, they went all the way. And of course, population began to boom because these folks had a good food source. They had clean water. They had, a, they had an ideal area to live in. So once you got down toward LA, it started getting warmer and warmer. It got to, to the, be 40 degrees. It got to be 70 degrees. We got down toward the equator in this time period. The people who came over here to Northwest Florida, you know, around 10,000, 8,000, 10,000 years ago, these folks found a climate that was pretty, that was pretty suitable for them, you know, and, and, they, and they progressed. They, they did quite well for themselves. They had plenty of good food. And here on Northwest Florida, they had plenty of seafood. And they did eat seafood along with other, with other uh, vegetation that they found here in the area. Okay, so these folks come in here, guys. They they use the bison, they use the woolly mammoths, and they survive. They have no problem surviving. They repopulate themselves, they grow, and they be, and they become very good at what they do. Their survival skills are on top. Okay, if you look at world history during this same time period, all humans are doing the same thing at the same time. By eight thousand BC. The people of the world are making baskets. Baskets are used for storage, food storage, and also for personal items that you want to keep. Okay? At the same time, they're playing with mud. They're using mud and clay to make what is called pottery, earthenware. And so they found a new way to have water contained. They found a new way to put food in. They found a new way for storage with their pottery. Wherever you go around the world, you find these two things happening about the same time. So you go to China history, you go to the history of India, Africa, the European history, Scandinavian history, Soviet Russia history. You go on to, to, to the new world and you, the, hemisphere, the Western hemisphere and you see these same things happen. So guys, we are trying, we are evolving along the same lines here during this time period. It's also around 8,000 BC that we started just discovering little seeds, little seed plants that turns into our crops. Over here in Mesoamerica, over here in the highlands of Mexico, that's between Mexico City and Phoenix, Arizona, you're going to see corn develop. They call it maize, a little weed that put out a seed pod on a stem and they started playing with it. They started watering it. They started putting manure around it. They found ways to make this grow taller. And it's going to evolve in, co in corn. Down in uh, Peru, down in South America, on the western side of South America in Peru, the Inca people are going to start playing with a crop that grows underground. This crop is called the potato. So you start seeing these folks playing around with these grains. Over in the Middle East, on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, you're gonna start seeing humans that are gonna start developing wheat and rye and flax and various other grains over in that region. Over in China, they're developing what is called rice, sugar cane. So people around the world are starting to work with agricultural pursuits around 8,000 BC, okay? By 2000 BC, these crops are scattering across the landscape. All over Southeast Asia, you're going to see rice and you're going to see sugar cane. All over Europe, you're going to see corn. I mean, you're going to see wheat. You're going to see barley. You're going to see uh, flax. You're going to see various kinds of peas that's being grown, beans, leeks, cucumbers, cabbages, Brussels sprouts. All of this is over in Europe during this time period. Okay, down in Africa, they're growing crops also. They have their bean crops, they have okra down here, they have sweet potatoes down here. 
You're going, are they call them yams? You're going to also see them ranging cattle. They're cowboys. They're ranging cattle out here. They, they have got a very stable civilization. Over in India, the same story. You start seeing the grain crops come into India. So you start seeing all this food stuff evolving or beginning to evolve around 8,000 BC. By 2000 BC, the food is pretty much spread across the areas of the world in which these folks live. In other words, guys, by 2000 BC, the people in North America have got corn. Okay, by, by the time of the Roman Empire, around one, around one AD, you're gonna start seeing potatoes being grown around the new world, okay? They also discovered in this time period, not only do you have corn, but they've also discovered various kinds of beans in the new world. Things like lima beans, black-eyed peas, field peas, zipper peas, y'all familiar with all of this stuff. These were being, were being discovered during this same time period, along with squash. Squash and gourds were a major part of their society during this time period. So guys, they started blending these crops together. The Native Americans realized if you plant your corn, your beans, and your squash together, that they grow better, they have better nutrients, but most importantly, the squash plant keeps the water level in the ground that supports the corn and the beans. So the shaded leaves of the squash is going to help out with the irrigation, the watering of your crop. The beans produce special fertilizers, special nutrients that help feed the squash. And the beans and the squash together put out nutrients that help support the corn. So beans, corn, and squash become the three sisters, the three sister crops of the new world. And these folks start heavily working on growing these foods, okay? So what I'm telling you here, guys, is this. When the people first came to the new world, they're going to be heavily involved in trying to find food. They go from place to place trying to find food here in this time period. All right? So guys, this food supply means they got to wander around the woods to find food sources. We call these folks hunters and gatherers. A hundred people have got to walk a hundred square miles to feed themselves. So take the people here at Santa Rosa Beach, the Santa Rosa people of this time period. They had to walk all the way up to Alabama from the beach and then walk out toward Laurel Hill, walk out toward Andalusia, maybe go as far as Atmore, Alabama, and then come southward again to feed themselves. They were always wandering. Their villages were portable. They did not have settlements yet. They're hunters and gatherers. They're trying to find food sources. If you had to go out today and try to find food in the woods, what would you find? Well, here in Northwest Florida, from in the early summer, you will find blackberries and you will find blueberries. And by August, you find these muscadine grapes that grow along the streams here in Northwest Florida. And you'll find food sources. And of course, you always got fish. You always got seafood. You got shrimp and oysters and all this good stuff. You got fish. There's plenty of food here for the people who are wanderers and gatherers. My question to you guys, are y'all still wanderers and gatherers? Do you go from place to place trying to find your food? Yes, you do. What do y'all do at Walmart? What do you do at Winn Dixie or at Publix? You're hunting and gathering, and you have baskets just like these folks had to carry your stuff in. Of course, your baskets are made out of metal and they have wheels on them. It's more convenient than carrying one in your hand. All right. And you go down to the grocery store and you try to find things you want to eat. And don't go there if you're hungry, you're going to overgather and overhunt. You're going to be in trouble. Okay. So guys, hunters and gatherers, we're still doing it. We're still trying to, to find food sources. We're still trying to improve our diets, trying to find something new to eat. Y'all ever get bored with food? Good Lord, I get so bored of the same old thing over and over again and have the same few restaurants here in Valparaiso and Nashville to choose from. And you just get kind of tired of it. And you want to change. You know, you want to get to go and find something different to eat. These folks are the same way. 
So they look forward to the different seasons when various nut trees and fruit and uh, fruit trees and berry bushes and so forth start producing. And they look forward to it. They knew when the time of the year it's going to be to go find all that good food. Now, what you guys know, realize one thing. The Native Americans do not have very many fruit trees. Fruit trees came to Europe, came from Europe. The pear, the peach, the apple, fig, the olives, all this came from Europe. So it won't be until, until the mid 1500s where you'll start seeing ample supplies of various fruits here in this time period. And most of it will be in the Caribbean where the Spanish are. It won't be anything in North America for a long time. All right, you won't be in touch with the soda comes through that you're gonna start seeing a few new items show up on the table. But uh, <clears throat> the Caribbean is where they're gonna produce all this new fruit. So the island of Cuba, the Bahamas, Jamaica, uh, 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 Puerto Rico, into the Yucatan Peninsula, into, into Mesoamerica where the Aztecs live, you'll start seeing fruit trees there first and then they'll expand from there. And matter of fact, guys, well, you'll know this, that eventually all these seeds of the new world are gonna end up in large markets. And you'll start seeing people bring seeds from the large markets back to the local area. Give you an example, the Santa Rosa people, they built large canoes and made their way up the river systems, up into Ohio, up into Indiana, Illinois of today. And across the river from St. Louis, the present day of St. Louis, Missouri, was a big, a big, huge civilization called Cahoka. Cahoka had close to 150,000 people who lived at Cahoka. And these folks on the Gulf Coast would bring salt and seashells and various materials up to Cahoka and trade them for mica and flint and for seeds. And they'd bring the seeds back down here and the, and the person you bought the seeds from we could tell you how to grow it. And so they brought the seeds back down here with them and they started growing their big farms, okay? They started, they started, they started using the seeds here for agricultural purposes. So the evolution of foodways is very important in American history. I could do a whole history class on foodways. That's how important food is to these folks during this time period and even into our day and the blending of foods and, food, and it's still going. Well, y'all hush. All right. So, guys, you're going to start seeing all this evolution take place as these folks begin to settle down. Around 4,000 BC, we start having our present day climate. We're going to have large thunderstorms, we'll have tornadoes. You're also going to see hurricanes come through. And so, you're going to start seeing the actual environment change around 4000 BC. And of course, that will expand farming. It's going to get warm in various places, and people can grow crops further north than they could at, uh, at any other place. Okay, so guys, the evolution here takes place with food waste and people settling down. You know, they were pretty ingenious people, they learned how to build houses and their houses were patterned behind the birds. They watched the birds build all kinds of nests, and they built their house like a nest. And what they would do is go out into an open area, and they'd draw a big circle, usually about 10 feet, up about 10 feet across. And around that circle, they're going to dig a hole. The hole will totally circle, will totally be dug out around that circle. And the holes were usually between four and six foot deep. After a hurricane comes through, there's plenty of fallen limbs. There's plenty of fallen logs and other items out there. And they would go and get what we would call fence posts. They'd be about 12 foot long. They'd put about six foot into the ground. Okay, so you had plenty of height on these for your, for your, for your buildings. And they put the post about two feet apart maybe, maybe a little bit less. I know when you go through and build decks, you need to have your decking boards about 18 inches apart, apart to make sure your deck will hold up and hold people and not fall through and collapse. So they went through, they put these posts up and they gingerly put the dirt around these posts. And of course they stomped the ground around the post and they poured water around it to make sure they get set into the ground. Okay. Then they went out and they got branches and limbs and they wove them between those posts. That is your wall, that is your infrastructure for your house. And once that was done, 
they would go and dig a hole next close by the house and they would go and pour water in it. If you get about four or five feet deep, deep in the ground here, not north, necessarily north, south of this county, but up toward Crestview, if you go three or four feet into the ground, you're gonna find plenty of you're gonna find plant, plenty of clay. And they pour water on this clay and make mud out of it. This mud became stucco. And they went through and stuccoed these walls around their houses. Inside and outside was totally stuccoed with clay. In the middle of the house, they'd build a raging fire and they cured the clay. The clay would then hold up. Most of these homes would last about 25 years. Once they got the walls put up, then they put, the, they put limbs across the top, had a slanted roof. They went about 16 feet up in the middle and they had bracing inside, they had support inside. And usually that's where the fireplace was built under the big hole in the roof. So when it rained, the water would go into the fire pit and not into the actual house. And sometimes they even put barrels, they, they put clay barrels, clay, clay pots under those openings to catch rainwater for drinking water. You know, guys, a hundred years ago, people collected rainwater in barrels and they drunk it. As a little boy, my grandmother had a, had a big, huge wooden barrel at, at where the, the piece of the house where it located and it, where the runoffs came down and she collected rainwater and we drunk it. And it was good water. I wouldn't do it today. It's gonna probably kind of gonna kill you because there's so much pollutant in the, in the air and the clouds. I wouldn't dare drink no rainwater, okay? But guys, they drunk the rainwater in this time period. They collected in these openings here when a rainstorm came through. And of course that helped keep kept the, the fire pit from getting soaking wet by having, the, by having, big, having large part, by having large pots put in here to catch the rainwater. Once they put the poles up to build the roof, they went out here in the woods and they collected one of these, these old palmetto limbs. They look like fans and they, and they attached them upside down. So, so the fans are coming down toward the bottom of the house. And of course that ran off the rainwater. And these houses were tight little nice houses they built here, mainly in, in South Alabama and Georgia and the Carolinas, Mississippi, Arkansas, here along Northwest Florida, they built these same kind of homes. And they enjoyed living here. In the summertime when it got too hot to be inside, and y'all know how that is, if you ever lived in a non-air conditioned world, you know, guys, air conditioning in houses is only about 50, about 55 years old. Uh, we didn't have air conditioning in the 1960s. My parents bought our first air conditioner, a window unit in 1968. And we had to open all the windows up and we had fans to try to get the hot air out of the house. So you stayed wet all the time. The only time you got dried off is you went to the beach and came back home, or you went down to the creek and came back home. Creek water would keep you cool for about, for about four or five hours. So in the late afternoons, going to the creek was an important thing to do to get cooled off. These folks did the same thing. They understand the importance of going into a creek and swimming and having a good time. They bathed. They were clean people. They were not dirty people. Those Europeans only bathed once a month, maybe three times a month at the most. They were a stinky bunch. Why do you think diseases cling to the, the people of Europe? They just didn't bathe regularly. And of course they didn't have the clean water we have here in North America. So it's a whole different attitude here for these people. So guys, <clears throat> they decided to build a deck for the summertime. It's called a chicky house. And what they did was they put up some tall poles, usually about 16 feet tall above the ground. So they're about 20 foot, 24 foot long post. And they put up four posts, one for each corner. They buried them like they did the logs in their houses, the, the, the fencing in their housing. And they built a deck about eight foot off the ground in the middle of this long log. They put a roof on it, just like they did on, on, their, on the other houses. And they had a place to stay eight feet above the ground during summertime. They put a ladder up there, they climbed up there, they ate up there, they slept up there, they put railings around it so the little kids wouldn't fall off. They could be outside all night long and not have to worry about mosquitoes. Mosquitoes don't get that high, usually. They also didn't have any problems with 
but the bad with the bears, the, the black bears that roam the Florida, the Florida panhandle, they were not concerned about alligators. They were not concerned about the Florida Panthers. And there were lots of those around during this time period. And so they felt safe up here in these, these, these shiki houses they built off the ground. If you guys go to Google and y'all type in uh, Native American housing and put around, put around the maybe 1400, or just type in the Mississippian period. Mississippian period is what the period they lived when Columbus came. So just type in Mississippian housing Native Americans and see what you come up with. Put it on images and see what you can find here and look at the way they lived here. The Spaniards, the French, and the British, the Portuguese, did a real good job documenting how these folks live. And so you will see them or see pictures of how they lived from the artists who came with Columbus and these explorers across the Atlantic Ocean. And they brought artists with them to document what they have seen. They also had journalists and diarists who wrote articles and described the location. They had linguists that could understand the languages after several days. They do hand signaling for the first couple of days and all of a sudden the words came and these linguists could talk to these Native Americans and vice versa. And all this history is still around. Barcelona, Spain is full of all the history that took place in the years of exploration or exp or, or, and exploring in this time period. So guys, it's all here. We still have all this information and it's, a, it's at your fingertips on the internet. You can go to look at all this stuff and research all this stuff. In my lecture notes, in my type lecture notes, I have found articles that I put on there that you guys can read to understand better what they're doing and how they're living and how they're progressing during this time period, okay? When the modern world starts appearing around 4,000 BC and the weather starts changing, you're gonna start seeing the new regions of North America. And I'm gonna give them to you guys so you can understand where they are. The first major region of North America is called the Coastal Plains. The Coastal Plains begins in South Texas. It starts about where San Antonio is. Laredo. It goes on out toward Corpus Christi in Victoria, Texas. It works its way up toward, toward Austin. It goes into Houston. And from there, it comes across Louisiana. It comes across South Mississippi. The coastal plains are about as far north Mississippi as, as Hattiesburg is. Then it goes on across toward Montgomery, Alabama. And here in Northwest Florida, it goes across the Florida Peninsula. And it makes its way up the Carolinas. It goes into Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. By the time you get to Goldsboro, North Carolina, the coastal plains begins to teeter out. It's not as prevalent up here. The coastal plains is usually identified by large oak trees that have Spanish moss on them. That's usually where the coastal plains is. Okay? Now, in our area, just north of the coastal plains between Montgomery and Birmingham, and it runs for, across Georgia and Mississippi, we have what is called the Black Belt. The Black Belt is a region of Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia that has real dense, dark clay. It's black in color. And this clay, this dark clay, becomes a major producer of cotton. Cotton is going to really expand across this region in the Black Belt. In Mississippi, just north of Jackson, that runs up to Memphis, Tennessee, it goes from Interstate 55 back to the Mississippi River system, is an area that's called the Delta. The Delta is an old ancient seabed in which the silt from the river and the, and the movement of soil through the air from, from Oklahoma and the west have filled it up. The old seabed is still kind of deep. When you leave Belzone, Mississippi, on, on, I know when you leave, uh, um, oh, what was a little town? Oh, shoot, I forgot a little town is that called now. It's outside of Oxford. It's on Interstate 55 heading, heading toward Memphis. When you, when you come to that little town, Batesville, when you come to Batesville and you start heading west toward Clarksdale, you go down a big, huge hill. I mean, it's a steep hill, and that's where the delta is. That land is all below sea level. And it's been flooded for the last couple of years. Uh, they've had a real problem in the Delta with flooding. We had a major flood here in 1927. And that major flood played a major role in creating what is called the Great Depression of the time period. And this area here becomes a major producer of cotton. 
that this land is, has the richest soil this side of Egypt, of the other Nile River. And the topsoil here in the, in the Delta is about 25 inches deep. The topsoil here in Northwest Florida is like three inches. It's not that much topsoil here. And the better your topsoil is, the better your farming is gonna be. And so out here you have what is called the Delta, okay? Go a little bit toward the west from the Delta and you come into an area in Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Missouri that's called the Ozarks. The Ozark Mountains. You guys have not been here. I suggest you go for a visit up here. It's about a 14 hour drive from here up there and you can fly it. Allegiant flies in there now from Eglin and to different locations like Fayetteville and so forth. And this area here is very interesting because you see signs of sea creating mountains. You see signs of volcanoes creating mountains. It's a totally different landscape out here. It's a beautiful part of the world to go to, but you see a lot of different natural uh, events that took place that created the Ozark Mountains, including the ice sheets. So that's part of it. Then you come back eastwardly and you come to what is called the Ohio Valley. The Ohio Valley here is where civil civilization really boomed here uh, around 2000 BC. You're gonna start seeing villages being built up here. They're also, you're gonna start seeing mound worshipers that live up here in this area. You're gonna start seeing a great civilization begin to develop around the Ohio River. And then of course you have the Great Lakes, which was formed by the ice sheets rescind rescinding, heading northward again. And then of course you have the mountains. You have the Mohawk Mountains, you have the Allegheny Mountains, you have the Appalachian, the Blue Ridge, all of this is going to be influenced by this great ice age, okay? And then just below the mountains on the eastern side, heading down toward Atlanta, heading down toward Lynchburg, Virginia, heading down toward Greensboro and Charlotte, you're going to have what is called the Piedmont. The Piedmont is where your fall lines are for your rivers. When I lived in North Carolina, I loved going out of Charlotte and going up toward Asheville and just kind of going to different places just to see them on the Piedmont. Lake Lure was a beautiful place up here. In the fall of the year, you had lots of pumpkins on the side of the road being sold. I'd go buy pumpkins, make pumpkin pies out of them. You had big, huge apple orchards and apples were for sale out here. My apartment complex in Charlotte was full of apple trees. They landscaped it with apple trees. And in August and September, you could go out in the, in the front yard of your apartment and pick apples and eat apples all day long and they were free. And we'd make pies and fritters and all kinds of good stuff from what they had up here in North Carolina. So the Piedmont area is a real interesting agricultural area, but it's also where Southern industry is going to begin. It's where industry up North begins because they use water power. And the Piedmont usually is where your waterfalls are located, okay? Then you head out toward the West again, and you head out toward the Northwest, and you're going to find what is called the Great Plains. The Great Plains is being, is being drained by the Missouri River. The Great Plains is also being influenced by the Red River, is being influenced by the Arkansas River. There's lots of rivers that run into the Great Plains. And this land is full of grassland, and it's also full of bison, it's full of buffalo. The buffalo herds out here were close to 400 million buffaloes that roamed the Great Plains. And they took care of the Great Plains. They fertilized it, they watered it, and they nibbled the grass. They didn't pull the grass up, they were like lawnmowers. And they took care of the Great Plains. When we decided to get rid of the buffalo herds, which was a terrible mistake, in the 1870s and 1880s, we killed the Great Plains the buffalo were required to keep the Great Plains alive, and we killed it. In the 1930s, we had the dust bowls. The, 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 the soil from this area began to blow away because of over agricultural pursuits here, mainly from the internal combustion tractors that came out during World War I. And so we destroyed it. We killed the land because we destroyed the, the, the animals that took care of it, okay? The old, the old Native Americans this time period would say, thus go the buffalo, go the people. Because they realize their great food source is going to go away. 
okay? And then you go out a little bit further and you have the Rocky Mountains. If y'all have not been to the Rockies, y'all need to go see all this area. This is a beautiful land. Go to British Columbia, go into Calgary, go into Alberta, Canada, go on down into New Mexico and Arizona. If you want to, there's interstate that runs from the north to the south. You can go from, from Montana or from Wyoming all the way down to Mexico on the interstate. And you can see all this land. You come down through, through Salt Lake City in this region. Then you have what is called the Four, the four Corners, the Great Basin. This is the corners of, of, of California, Arizona, Mexico, Nevada, that part of the world. And this is where the Grand Canyon is located. And then, of course, your final major area of the country is going to be the Pacific coastline, the coastline that runs from the Aleutian Islands all the way down to the Baja. And so you will have this area here to, to consider. This was all being formed here, guys, uh, after the great, the great Ice Age had ended here. Okay? Well, guys, these folks are doing pretty well for themselves. They have learned how to do agricultural pursuits. And by 2000, most of these Indian farmers are doing what is called slash and burn. They realize that they cannot destroy their environment. The Native Americans believe the great father put them here to take care of the earth. They did not cut down their forest. Oh, they did thin them, but they didn't cut them down. In the early winter months, January, February, March, they would go and burn the land. They realized that they go through and burn the, the foliage under the big pine trees and under the big huge oak trees across the country. If they burn the foliage, it keeps down on forest fires during the hot months of the summer. But keeping the foliage down, it helps to bring in new nutrients for the pine trees. That's why the Air Force Base, that's why Jackson Guard burns the forest here in Northwest Florida. Y'all know that in January and February, you look up toward the north, look up toward Crestview, and you will see all the smoke billowing up from them burning fire, burning the, burning the ground out here. And they're very careful not to go through and destroy the pine trees. And of course, when they burn the land, it brings a new birth. The, the, the animals have better, have better vegetation to eat from, you start seeing the palmettos come back up pretty quickly and they are nice and strong and healthy looking. All right, the Indians would go through and choose a couple of trees to, to uh, kill. They would go through and take their big, huge carving stones, which is usually quartz crystal that was sharpened, and they would cut a circle around the tree and then they'd put salt inside of the tree, inside that cut. And of course that killed the trees. They killed two or three of them. And then they'd make mounds, little dirt mounds to plant their corn, their beans and their squash. They also had what was called the river fields. If you guys go across the Southeast, if you, let's say if you go on Highway 84, I like Highway 84. That's one of the most beautiful roads I've been on from Savannah, Georgia, from Bainbridge, Georgia, all the way across the Natchez. It's a beautiful highway. It's two lane, but it's also four lane. It's four lane across Georgia and it's four lane across Mississippi. Alabama's about halfway finished with it, but they're not working on it anymore. It's just sitting there. But Highway 84 goes across all these major rivers here, the Chattahoochee. It goes across the Alabama. It goes across the Tom Bigby. It goes across the Leaf and the, and the Chickasahaya. It goes across the Pearl River, and it makes its way up to Natchez, where the Mississippi River system is located. And on all these rivers on Highway 84, the eastern side have, has high banks. You go up here to Grove Hill, go up here to Monroeville, Alabama, and cross the river up here at Gosport. The bank on the eastern side of that river is 75 feet high. It's a high bank. The bridge going across the river goes downhill. It's a, it's a bridge that don't go straight across the river. It goes downhill across the river. Okay? And on the, on the western side are the big, huge flood plains. This is true of all the rivers here across the south. And you'll see a white beach. You'll see a little white beach along the side of the river. And then you'll have the swampy area, the, the overflow area. Okay? The Native Americans call this the river fields. My grandpa calls he, as a little boy, used to talk about the river fields. How they'd go to the Homochita River and along the river plant their crops. And they'd be there at sunrise and plant those crops. The wagon from the house would come in to feed them. Yeah, they had a food truck. It's a wagon. It had food on it. 
They delivered the food to them. They took about an hour to just relax. Sometimes they'd go swimming in the river. They'd eat their dinner. And by one o'clock, they're back at work again. Then at sunset, they would join hands and sing old gospel songs. One of their most favorite songs was when they ring them golden bells for you and me. And you think about all these folks, white folks, black folks, Native American folks, Creole folks out here in these fields, and a big circle holding hands. And that circle is an African tradition that comes to the New World, by the way. And they sing an old religious song to end the day. And they'd go home. And they had a camaraderie among themselves. They told stories, they sung music, they had a good time out there. Even the work was hard and treacherous and dangerous. They worked together. America has lost this. And I hope that through this pandemic and through other problems, that America will rejoin the hands in a circle and sing when they ring them golden bells for you and me. And bring back the way it used to be in America, where people were neighbors and met on the front porches in the evening and told stories. You know, I miss all that stuff. People would bring their banjos and their guitars and, and, and their horns and whatever to the front porch and have a musical concert in the neighborhood. And they'd cut watermelons and make ice cream and do all kinds of neat things on the front porch. And we've got to get back to that front porch, guys. It's very important. Now I'm rambling. I got to get back on the subject again. But guys, these river fields were very important because the men are the ones who took care of the fields. The men are the ones who prepare the fields for, for cultivation. They went up there and they rode up those fields. They, they used their chopping tools. They used those, those, those hoes made out of stone and they rode up the land in order to plant their crops. And they also used crop rotation. These native folks did. The ones who actually grew the crops, the agricultural people will be the women. The women are the farmers of this time period. You see, the Native Americans lived in what is called a matrilineal society. Women control society. And society stabilized. Society did quite well for itself when women controlled it. Oh, the men would go off hunting and fishing and having a good time. Their main job was to make sure everybody was safe and had good housing and the fields were prepared for crops. And they had their side of life to do, and the ladies were the agricultural side. And they took care of the household. They took care of the home, the children, and so forth. By the way, these Native American women would usually get married around age 17. By age 18 or 19, the first baby came. And these young ladies were usually pregnant every 24 months. Some of these ladies had as many as 14 to 20 babies in their lifetime. When the Europeans come over to the New World and they start settling, the average family in the, eight, in the 1790 federal census, the average family had eight children. That's the average family had eight children. So you see a lot of, you see a lot of childbirth. If you have a baby, you have the baby out in the fields. You're out there working in the fields and that baby comes. And you'd have that baby, and the older adults, the ones who could not work, were your child care keepers. And they'd carry those young born babies, those newborn babies, to a little old lady or a little old man who was a babysitter. Now, if you've got four or five or six or 20 little kids under the age of five years old, and they're hyper as hell, they're crazy. They're just little crazy people running around doing they want to. I remember my crazy days of being a little kid, having a good time and, and doing all kinds of crazy stuff you could get hurt doing. And mama trying to stop you from doing crazy stuff. Well, in order to get the kids in line, they dug a hole in the field. On the outside edge of the field, they dug a hole. The hole might be 10 feet across and about four foot deep. And they put the kids in a hole. That's your playpen during the time period. So the kids couldn't climb out of that hole because it's too, it too deep. And that's where you put the little kids to keep them from running off and drowning in the, in, the, in the river or getting hit by a snake or whatever. You put them in that hole in the ground. Now, how'd you guys like be putting a hole in the ground you're three years old? All right, you probably, probably get mad as all get out because they, they rounded you up and put you in that dang hole. 
All right, but that's how I took care of the children in this time period. Your adults were your daycare keepers. How many of you guys stayed with grandma and grandpa until you started school? Mom and dad worked, they couldn't afford daycare. The grandparents were handy. And if you was lucky, you had your mama's parents and you had your daddy parents in the same town. And so you switch off. Give each other a break here on the, on the daycare business, all right? So you see all this happening even in these people's lives. So what I'm telling you guys is these Native Americans look just like us. They look just like us. The same needs, the same wants, the same protection for your children, and so forth. How about protection for your children? These Native people had, a, had an elaborate medical program. They knew what kind of bushes and what kind of trees produced various kinds of antiseptics and various kinds of aspirins and so forth. They knew how to use, use clay packs. They, they would get these hot peppers, which we did have from Arizona and so forth, and they make a paste out of them. They put it on your chest, on that paste on your chest, and put some clay on top of it that made it all get hot. And all of a sudden, your bronchitis began to break up. And you started coughing all this mess up, okay? You had pine trees down here. They used the pine sap to put on boils and put on sores that would not heal. And it burned like the devil, but they used it and it healed. They take that old pine rosin off the trees and they boil it in water, get it really hot in hot water and make turpentine out of it. You make turpentine the same way you make liquor. You put it into a steel with water. Instead of using corn mash, you use turpentine sap. You use a rosin. And these guys make turpentine, and they would put honey in the turpentine. Your sweetener was honey in this time period. And so they put honey in that, in that liquid turpentine and make you swallow it. And made you get hot all over. It raised your temperature. And your nasal cavities broke open and all that, and all that sinus pressure release. You got rid of the sinus, you got rid of the sinus problem. It opened your lungs up and all that old and all that old uh, mucus and mess would come up out of your lungs and you'd get well from it. Or an earache, they'd put warm turpentine in your ear to get rid of an earache. Now don't you guys try this stuff. Y'all go to the doctor. Y'all go to the y'all go to the ER, but don't y'all dare start doing this self-medicine stuff that I'm telling you about. And by the way, that's another whole class in medicinal history and how people made various kinds of of, of ointments and, and salves and aspirins and capsules and so forth to take care of, of various kinds of, of injuries. If you got a real bad cut and it wouldn't heal, instead of packing it with gauze like we do today, they put spider webs over it. They'd also put, put a wasp's nest in it. They'd tear the wasp's nest apart and they'd pack it into that hole, put a little bit of turpentine on top of that and it'd start healing. So they had various ways to take care of medicinal problems here. They took care of their children. And I want to tell you something. In Europe, three out of five children did not live to be five years old. In North America, 90% of your children live to be five years old. And most of these kids live to adulthood, okay? So these folks are, are very well settled, good housing, agricultural pursuits going on here. They're great hunters going on here. They're doing quite well for themselves, okay? Now let's kind of look at what they're eating here besides just corn and potatoes and, and beans and corn and so forth. The people of North America had the best beef sources of anybody in the world. They had the bison, they had the elk, they had the deer, the white-tailed deer, they had bear, they had beavers, they ate prairie dogs, they ate possums, they ate raccoons, they also ate squirrels and rabbits. And all these food sources provided them with byproducts. You go through and you kill a rabbit, you got, you got, you got a good piece of fur. And you take some seagrass and some, and some needles made out of fish bones, and you sew you these together with that, with that seagrass and it'll hold. You can make your blanket out of this, out of this rabbit skin here. The, uh, the skin from, from, the, from the squirrels. 
Squirrels have little similar bodies. They're kind of long, got two legs off the end, the head and the tail. And what you would do is when you skin out the squirrel, you actually skin out the whole squirrel. You cut him down the middle and you pull his, you pull his shirt off of him first and then you pull off his britches. You cut the tail off and you take that piece of fur, that piece of, that piece of hide off that wrap, off that uh, squirrel, and you boil it in hot water. You put in those earthenware jugs that you have made, uh, earthenware bowls, you put it on your, on your fire pit, and you are going to boil it, not boil the fur off of this animal. So you'll have the hide, and you'll stretch it, and you'll, and you'll let it dry for several weeks. And then you'll sew the legs together, with the sea grass, make it waterproof, and you will have an opening at the very top of that of that of that animal. When they made pottery and put it in the fire, they made little round balls. These little balls were kept in your in your pouch. You kept your little ball with you. You might have three or four of them here that you carried with you in 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 your sessional or in your in your carrying case, in your fanny pack, if you will. <clears throat> You're out on a mission, you're out in the swamp and you're hungry and you find some muscle or you find some nice looking wild mushrooms and you might find some various kinds of berries that you like and all you guys get together and y'all get yourselves about a, a bunch of that stuff all gathered up and you put it inside that pouch. Then you build a fire. And in that fire, you put those little round ceramic balls. And they get real hot pretty quickly. And you get you a couple of sticks and you pick them up like chopsticks and you drop it inside of that pouch. You hold the top closed and the contents being shrimp or oysters or mussel or whatever will cook in that pouch. If you're in the woods, you find yourself a bay tree and put a bay leaf in there. You got a little bit of sea salt with you that you have got from the Gulf because they did be they did make salt ponds and they did have salt production going on down here, and they put a little bit of salt in there. They let it cook for about maybe five or six minutes, and then they'd reach in there and push that ball out, let it fall on the ground so it cool off. You don't want to touch, you don't want to hold it if it's real hot. That hold the pouch open for a few minutes for everything inside to kind of cool down. They turned it up and they drank it instant nourishment. I'm telling you here, guys, that these folks produce their first Hot Pockets. That makes, makes pretty good sense here. They didn't, they didn't need a microwave oven. They had, they had that little round ball that could get hot and they could cook food with it. And you could lay out fillets of fish on, 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 a, on, a, on a piece of log and put those little balls along that fish and cook it that way. So they had a good way of, of having a portable grill with them all the time. And they love to grill their food. They love to cook their food over an open fire. So if it be bison or elk or buffalo, whatever it might be, they could barbecue it and they would cut it into slices. They use the, they use those core crystal cutting tools they had. If you guys go to the Facebook page for American History One, just type in NWFSC and spell out American History One. You'll go to my Facebook page. And I've got a collection of tools that I found in the museum in Nat that I found the museum at Vicksburg. And you can look at all those different tools they used here in this time period. And you can you get an idea when I'm talking about say cutting tools and, and tools for farming and so forth. They have all these different kinds of tools on display. And by the way, the Facebook page is my museum. We don't have a good museum in Northwest Florida. So I'm building a Facebook page to make it turn to a museum so you guys can find all kinds of neat local history in my history one museum. I got one for history two also. And uh, there's some neat stuff in both of them. You can see American History 2 pictures and see what Destin looked like in the 1920s and the 1950s and how our county looked in the 1950s. Just type in NWFSC American History 2 and go to that website. And they're both hooked up on your blackboard. You just go to the blackboard and you'll find it there listed and just click on it and you go right to it. And you can see what all I put on there for you guys to look at. I'm always looking for new things. If you guys find something that you like and they got to be interested in seeing, y'all send it to me. Send me the link on email and I'll look at it. And then I'll attach it to my Facebook page. So y'all can do that for me. And we can build a great little, a great little library, a great little museum on Facebook.
all right? A whole new way of doing Facebook than it was in the past, okay? Well, guys, these folks also develop a barbecue grill. They took large rocks and they made a circle. Now, down here on the beach, they use seashells. And they loved eating oysters, and they loved, and they, and they, and they loved collecting the shells of the oysters. As a matter of fact, they made big mounds all over South Walton County out of seashells. And these mounds would be 20 feet high and be solidly made of seashells from the oysters. And of course, all your developers who came in here in the last 50 years and tore the woods up, destroyed the environment these people used to enjoy, and they mowed down all these seashell mounds. I wish we still had one or two. I need to go out there and say, like I can find the ones I used to, to, used to go around when I was a little kid going to the beach. We go out to Grayton Beach, go to the beach in the 1950s, early 1960s. It's a nice little wayside park that's kind of hidden now down there. You have to go and look for it. It's off, it's off 30A. And there were, there were seashell mounds all over the place down there. And they're no longer there. They built houses on top of all those seashells. So you guys go down 30A and go down toward topsoil. You might be able to discover some remnants of these old seashell mounds out here. If you guys live in South Walton and want to have an afternoon of exploring, y'all go look for those seashell mounds. If you find one or two, send me the picture of them and I'll put it on Facebook. Okay, so we all become partners on this Facebook page and start creating all this interesting information here about local history. Okay, well guys, they took these seashells and made a big circle out of them. They took rocks up north and made a big circle out of them. And in the middle, they stacked up firewood, usually wood that's been blown over by a storm, dried, dried timber. You had to be careful because you had snakes in all this old dried wood. And these rattlesnakes down here look just like the woods. If you're not careful, you'll step on a rattlesnake. If you're not careful, you'll, you'll stoop down next to a rattlesnake. And then you got a situation to deal with. How do I get out here without getting myself bitten by this rattlesnake? Okay? So these folks are going in all this, dr all this driftwood, all this dried wood, and put it in the middle of those rocks. Then they go into the woods and find some sweet gum trees. Sweet gum trees has a gummy interior. It's got a gummy sap in it. And it does not catch fire real easily. You don't put no sweet gum in your fireplace. You'll be there all day trying to build a fire. Oh, you're going to get smoke. You won't get a fire. You're going to get smoke. All right, they'd find a limb that's, about, that's close to being eight foot long, and at the end of that limb, it forked out. And they cut the limb off at the, at, at, the, at the trunk of the tree, and then they cut the limb off about this far above the bees, where it beat out. Okay, you see what I'm going to with this? They get four of these, and they put these four bead of uh, sweet gum limbs at each corner of the fire pit, of the fireplace. Okay, or the barbecue grill. And they would dig a hole or hammer these things into position. They'd get them deep enough so they wouldn't fall over. You put a lot of meat on your grill and they wouldn't fall over. That'd be a disaster having all your meat covered in sand down here on the Gulf Coast. And then they'd go into the woods and find the cane patches. You had cane fields that grew wild all over the Southeast. Cane was called Kaneka. Kaneka was a name for cane. And you had these big, huge cane thickets. So, matter of fact, you got in trouble and somebody's after your hide and wants to beat the hell out of you, you'd head for the cane patch. You could squeeze in between these canes and get in there and nobody could find you. If a bear got after you or a panther got after you, you'd squeeze into the cane patch and they couldn't get to you. So the cane was pretty important. The same cane is used today for fishing. Your fishing poles is made from the same cane. Well, they cut the cane green and they cut about 10 or 12 pieces of cane and they chopped them off to be about six feet long and they made a woven barbecue grill out of them. The actual grill top was made out of this cane. So you had an opening about this wide between the cane. So we had these little squares that was made out by, by, by weaving this cane together. And they put the cane and they tied off the seagrass. They used various kinds of vines, whatever they might have. They tied off the corner so the fire wouldn't get a hold of it. And they put the grill into the slots of the sweet gum tree. So you had a grill that's usually about four or five feet off the ground. 
and you can lay up, lay up there big slabs of buffalo meat or white-tailed deer skin meat or whatever, and you had a barbecue going on. And they put the sea salt in there, they put the pepper on there, they had pepper plants, they put them on there. They put some bay leaves on there, ground it up. They might find a little bit of a little bit of uh, licorice in the swamps. They might put a little bit of licorice on there for flavoring. You know, they found ways to make sure paprika was around here in the, in the new world. They could put a little bit of paprika. They had the plant here. They could do that also. They found ways to season their meat, make sure, make sure it'd be tender and it'd be good to eat. It'd be wholesome. Well, the guys, the thing about the meat here is it's low in pro, it's low in cholesterol and high in protein. In other words, you had Indian men who were 65 years old who still had their abs. They did not eat a whole lot of carbs. They mostly ate meat. While a little bit of carbs they had is going to come from the corn, your cornbread, and your, and, your and your taco shells. You know, and they did make that in Mexico. They did have tacos going on in Mexico during this time period. You could get you a deer skin taco and get you a fish taco, get you a shrimp taco, get you an oyster taco. You know, you might go get you a rabbit taco or, or a possum taco. I'm gonna call a taco taco. I'm gonna call a, a, a taco bell and tail. Then then you go through and start doing a possum taco, just for us southerners. Well, some of you guys are gonna order that one up and try it out. Okay, but guys, they had a good diet. They had a real good diet. And then of course they had all this fish. They ate lots and lots of fish. Okay, and shrimp and oysters. Up in the Great Plains and up in Ohio, they made fish traps in their creeks. They take rocks and make a V out of them. The walls would be about three feet high. The fish would swim into it because they were, the fish, the, the V's were made to go into the running water that's heading toward the V. The fish swims in, it cannot get out. These Indian folks would go out with their, their with that big, huge, uh, uh, oak split wood baskets and gather up this fish just grapple it out of that opening and they'd go and knock the scales off of it they would salt and pepper it they'd take care of it be real good they put some bay leaves inside of it they put it on their barbecue grill and they grilled it so they went out pheasants they, they would make nets out of seagrass to catch birds it had various kinds of, of various kinds of arrowheads they were used to kill animals with and on, on, on the end of their bows or end of their arrows. They used bows and arrows here with, 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 uh, with the, uh, the, the quartz crystal uh, points on them, the arrowheads on them. And they killed animals that way. And they killed pheasants. They ate lots of turkey. If you wanted eggs to eat, you found you a turkey nest. You'd go through and find you a quail nest. Or you'd go through and find you a pheasant nest. And that's where you got your eggs from. Over in Europe, they had chickens. We didn't have chickens over here. Okay? Over in Europe, they had milk cows. We don't have milk cows over here. They ate beef. We don't eat beef over here. They had hogs in the new world. We don't have hogs here. In the, they ha they had, uh, had hogs in the old world. There's no hogs in the new world. We didn't have no hogs. So what we have here, guys, is food that's high in protein and low in cholesterol. The Europeans eating cows and eating sheep and eating goats, and eating hogs, and eating bread and butter and all this stuff, all this high cholesterol stuff. They didn't live past, past, past age 50. A 50 year old was an old person in European culture. And here in our culture, here in North America, people are living to be 80 years old because of the food sources. Food makes a big difference in your lifestyle, in your health. And these folks had a good supply of all this going on during this time period. Okay? So they're the ones who brought in the barbecue grill. We're going to do the history of barbecue here in a little bit. We discuss who all brought stuff to the table to create barbecue. And it took all three different groups who came to North America to do this. It took the Europeans, it took the Africans, and it took the Native Americans to bring in Southern barbecue. We're gonna bring that all together here in a little bit uh, in, this, in this session of class, okay? By 2000 BC, these people are growing corn, squash, beans, chili peppers. We had wild onions, we had celery, we had peanuts. 
We had pineapples, we had tomatoes, we had watermelons, we had tobacco, which was used for medicinal purposes. It was used as a medicine, tobacco was. We had pumpkins, avocados, we had chocolate, we had vanilla. That is gonna to totally change European food lines in the 1500s when chocolate and vanilla shows up in these kitchens of Paris. They're gonna go crazy. I'd like to been there and they made that first big pot of brownies. You can just imagine how they went crazy over that food from the new world. We had blackberries and blueberries and dewberries and strawberries. We had raspberries. We had pecan trees. We had hickory nut trees. We had walnuts. They even ate acorns. Have you guys tried to eat an old oak acorn? They taste awful. They're the most bitterest mess in the whole world, but they ate them. They put some honey on them and ro slow roast them and all this kind of stuff. Put some sea salt on them. They're ready to go. I can't even hardly even think about eating it. It's a nasty taste to it. They made, they had sassatoon berries. You go to Canada, their blueberries are called sassatoon berries, but their blueberries taste like cherries. My brother Scott lived in Calgary for several years. I'd fly up there. And one afternoon, I, I, I had to carry my sister up there with me on one of the trips. And her and I went off gallivanting with Scott, with Scott and Tara at work. And we went to a Saskatoon farm. Big, huge agricultural barn. The whole nine yards had a restaurant in there. The whole shebang. And I bought me a Saskatoon pie. It had strawberries in it. And I want to tell you something. I've never in my life had a pie as good as that pie is or was. And uh, such a tunes make really good things. Another little sideline. Down below Alberta is a museum that is called Smashed In Head Buffalo. Smashed In Head Buffalo Jump. It's crazy. Of the top 10 museums of the world, it's in the top 10. They went to that cliff where the buffalo jump was located and they built a five-story museum. And it covers the complete history of Alberta's Indian nations, mainly the Crow Indian group. And outside the museum, they have a big, huge Indian reservation set up. They got all kinds of teepees. You can walk through it and actually experience the way people live after the Ice Age. It's a, it's a really interesting place to go. I'd love to have a road rules history class where you go get a bus and about 15 students and just take off going to museums around the country. Take six weeks and just hit the country. Give y'all 12, 12 hours of credit for doing the class. So the whole summer is not wasted. You'll have the whole six weeks, eight weeks of summer to do all this wonderful trip here across the country. And it'd be remarkable. Now, in the age of pandemics, we can't do all that stuff. But maybe one day we can. The old folks do it through the, through the AARP. They have the big tours a lot of this nature. Well, I went there, guys, and I learned something. They had a big, huge ramp that was marked off by small bushes. Buffaloes only see forward. They can't see to the sides. And so seeing these bushes... Is like making a runway for them. And the runway goes off the cliff. It's some 75 feet down to the bottom. They run off this cliff. And they get the buffaloes herded up there on the plains of, of Alberta, and they run them down toward this jump. And they'd send 40 buffalo across the jump at one time. And they'd be piled up down there on top of each other, dead as a doornail. The men folks would go out there and pull the buffalo apart. Drag them out here in the Great Plains. Now, remember, guys, in Alberta, Canada, in the middle of July, it gets down to about 55 degrees at night. It gets down to 40 some night up there. So you got refrigeration to a certain extent. Daytime high is usually around 60. I love leaving here in the middle of August and going to Alberta. It'd be 100 degrees down here and be 60 degrees up there. And being up there for two weeks, you kind of got cooled off. You didn't want to really come back home because it'd be so hot down here. Well, they'd run these buffalo off the cliff. They took and took the skins off the buffalo. They cured the skins to make tents and make clothing and so forth out of. And then the women folks took the actual meat. They took the meat of the buffalo. They used their quartz crystal carving stones with it. And they carved off little thin fillets. It's like bacon. 
It looks like bacon. They hung this meat all over the little trees, the little bushes, all over the prairie areas of Alberta, Canada. They might have maybe 10 miles squared full of drying buffalo meat. And they guard it pretty regularly to make sure the bears didn't come in. You got grizzly bears up here that are big as houses. I saw one of these rascals. His snout was about, was about eight foot long. And, he, and it's about four foot, I mean, it's, it's, about, it's about eight inches long and about eight inches, I mean, about four inches across. A big old huge snout on that bear. He's a pretty good sized bear. I don't want to mess with him. Well, guys, once the, once the meat had dried, the men folks would go out and collect big baskets full of sassatoon berries. They let the berries dry. And then they would put the fillets of meat onto grinding stones with the berries and they would grind them together. And they took this mixture and they patted it into little protein bars. I'll show you what it kind of looks like here, guys. Or about like the kind bars are. But they look just like this does. Okay, and they made thousands of them, and they stored them in those big, huge oak baskets they made, and put them into a cool place. Now, guys, Alberta only has about four months of summertime. By the, by the first of October, it's cold again. By by May day, by the first of May, it starts getting warm. It gets pretty warm in June, July, and August, but September starts cooling off in October. You got snow coming. I went up there during Thanksgiving, the place was covered in snow. Went up there in, in early May and it's covered in snow. Okay, so guys, these folks here had their food source for the winter. They ate these protein bars all winter and they made it. They did just fine for themselves. They had the, awesome, they had the vitamins, they had the protein, they had everything they needed in those protein bars. So yes, these Native Americans, these early crow people up here had a GNC going on eating those protein bars here, okay? So the sassafras berry is pretty important, okay? You also are gonna see them have sassafras. Sassafras trees grow all over the South. Uh, nowadays, you find them around power lines. The sassafras leaf looks kind of like a fig leaf, pretty good size leaf. If you rub it with your thumb and your forefinger, it smells just like root beer. Early root beer was made from sassafras plants. And they'd go and dig up the root of sassafras. You can do this, and it's pretty good. I want you guys to try. If you guys live out around Crestview or out toward Duniac Springs or out toward Freeport, out in the rural areas, you can find sassafras pretty regular, pretty, pretty easily. And y'all go look for it, and y'all rub it. It smells like root beer sassafras. And then you dig the root up. You don't need a very big piece of root, just a little piece of root is all you need. You go home and you wash it off real good and you, and, you, and you carve off the outside skin of it, you descend it, and you wash it again and you put it into a boiling pot of water. The water turns a deep pink color. You put some sugar in there, add some cold water to it and make a tea out of it. And this was used, guys, for drinking purposes, but it also was used to make alcohol out of it. Let it ferment. All right, they also use it for the stomach ache because they taste kind of like Pepto Bismol. Okay, so sassafras was out there uh, and they was using that. They use honey for sweetening. We did not have any other way to make sweetener than honey here. And then we had various kinds of spices. We had bay leaves, we had, pe we had peppers, we had lemon vaporina, and we also had paprika. So, and, and remember also the, 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 uh, the bay leaf on that one too, okay? So they had ways to go through and, so, and season their food. So these folks are very remarkable. I do not want you to ever judge these people as being backward. They were not backward. Their food ways are superior to the European food ways. They had better food over here. You know, the Europeans went through the Black Death in the, 15, in the 1340s, and the Black Death killed over a third of the people of Europe. Over 30 million people died from the Black Death. What recovered population 
in the 1500s, and the Black Death was still happening in the 1500s, what recovered the population and probably ended the Black Death was the new food sources from North America because part of that Columbian exchange, bringing the old world crops over and bringing the new world crops back and blending the crops together and making a better food source here. All right? You know, them getting brownies in, in, in Paris is like the folks over here in, in Mexico City getting, getting bread, having actual wheat bread, another way, another thing they never had before, something to improve your diet with. Okay? So you start seeing all this transpire here in this time period. So that's pretty much takes care of how they actually are existing in this time period. Their culture is going to be matrilineal. Women control culture. When a young married man marries a young woman, he goes to live with her family. You take the last name of your women, folks. It's totally different what Europe does. Europeans are patrilineal. Men control society in Europe. The women are sub -subrant. The women don't have a real place in society because the men control everything. They're greedy over their control. They control the church, the school, the politics, the castles, the farmland. It's all being controlled by the men folks. And the women and children have very little say in the, in the scope of things here in this time period. So these women here have a more open and more free society than the Europeans do. Work is divided here among these people. You do have your chiefs and you have your social leaders here in your, in your, in your tribes, in your, in your Indian villages. You have your religious leaders. You even have prophets in this time period. Religious leaders want to make sure that everybody's on board with the agenda of the great white God and they protect the land, that they do not destroy the landscape. You have your workers. You have your farmers. That's your most important bunch. Europeans, Chinese, Southeast Asia, India, Middle East, Africa. Farming was where it was at. Close to 90% of your people were involved in some kind of agricultural pursuit during this time period, okay? And that'd be true when America first begins. It's gonna still be about 90% that are on the land working the farms in the colonial period. You'll have 10% in, in, in the countryside. That number does not change until the 1920s. In 1920, we have more people in the rural areas, I'm sorry, more people in the urban areas than in the rural areas. That's, 18, that's, that's a 1920 federal census. That's only been 100 years ago. So before that time, we were very much agricultural people, okay? You also have your metal workers, you have your butchers, you have your hunters, you'll have your, you'll have your carpenters, You'll have your tanners who work with leather, okay? You have your millers who mill the grain, the corn, the cornmeal. You'll have your basket makers. You'll have your pottery makers. You'll have engineers. You'll have construction workers. And you have slavery. But here's the big difference. In Native American slavery, you only use slavery to repopulate your tribe or your village. Let's say a tornado comes through your village and destroys it, and you lose several dozen people. You get them buried, and then as a group, you go off hunting for some new kin folks. You go off hunting for slaves, and you might go 100, 125, 130 miles away, and you find a village, and you raid it, and you take the people, mainly children, back with you, to your village and for seven years from five to seven years i should say these folks are like slaves but after five or seven years you free them and they become part of your population so slavery is a short-term deal it is, it is designed to create a new kinship group if you should lose a lot of people through a disaster and tornadoes did occur, guys. Hurricanes occurred. I mean, those, those chicky huts didn't last very long in a hurricane. And if you was up there on one of them trying to avoid the flood waters and it all got blown apart, you were in some real trouble. Okay? So you had these different levels of workers. When it came to politics, you had councils who met. Your, all your cities have councils. 
You know, they got a planning committee that meets and they have the city commissioners that meet and they try to draw out plans for the future, how to expand the village, how to go through and improve the infrastructure and so forth. Okay, you had judicial bodies. You had safe cities. If you committed a crime and you wanted to make sure that you did not become a, a major prisoner or slave, you could go to a safe, to a safe city. And, and find refuge there for up to seven years. You can return back home and everything's been forgiven. This, there's no problem here. You know, today we have cities of refuge for immigrants. We have, we have, these, we have these refuge centers. Along the same lines, guys, as this right here was back in the time of the, uh, when the Native Americans controlled all this area. They had public works. They built trading paths. They built roads. They built harbors along the, along the riverfronts. You know, there's one tribe here that's called the Natchez. The Natchez tribe lived in southwest Mississippi. The Natchez tribe built a road that went from Natchez, Mississippi, up toward Jackson, up toward Tupelo, and on into Nashville, Tennessee. It's called the Natchez Trace, a major road of trade. They also built a trading path that went out toward Alexandria, Louisiana, made its way out toward where present-day Shreveport is. And from Shreveport, it went northward to Kansas City of today, and the western leg went out toward Dallas-Fort Worth. And these Natchez tribes used this trading path regularly as a source of trade here to bring goods into the Natchez villages. And they did quite well for themselves here at Natchez with these trading paths here. Highway 90 going through Crestview is an ancient Indian trading path. It's going to go from Texas all the way to St. Augustine, Florida. It's an old original Indian trading path. Interstate 75, Interstate 20, Interstate 10, Interstate 70, Interstate 35 in the middle of Texas, Interstate 55 up to Mississippi. These were old Native American trading paths. Our highways today are built on original Indian trading paths. A lot of your little communities and a lot of your large cities were Indian villages during this time period. Stone Mountain, Georgia was a place of worship and they've had a village out here where Atlanta is. Memphis was called, was called Chickasaw Bluff during this time period. And they had a big Indian village out here. So we have built on top of all of these Indian villages and are using their same road system. Y'all realize that? That's why archaeologists goes into new construction areas, like in downtown Pensacola, where it's full of artifacts from the past, mainly Spanish artifacts. And they survey the land before they build on it, trying to find out what happened on this land hundreds of years ago. Yes, we're going up and digging up trash, trying to figure out how they live in the past. Okay? Then you have the scientists. I want to tell you something. The people of Europe during the, during the Dark Ages didn't have any science. During the Dark Ages, they were totally stagnated. They didn't have any, very, very little bit, a little bit of learning. Your royal courts and your, and your large landowners, your lords and barons might hire a tutor for the children, but other way, you were, you were educated during this time period. And these folks here were heavily involved in science, especially, uh, especially uh, studying the stars, you know, doing astrology type work. And they built their cities patterned after constellations and patterned after heavenly bodies in this time period. They had good medicine, as I mentioned a while ago. They had great medical science. Do you know they were doing brain surgery in Tijuana land? The Aztecs and the Mayans were actually doing brain surgery. People would have strokes and they'd go in and open up the arteries and release the pressure and people survived. They did cataract surgery. I had this done several years ago, and the cataract forms a, forms a scale over your eye, and your cornea is totally useless. You cannot hardly see, and these folks learned how to remove these cataracts. They used fishbone surgery, and they took out the cataract the same way we do it today. They would go and slice the side of the eye, pull out that lens, and re-sew it, and you regain partially your sight. Now, today you get implants. And uh, with my implants here, I'm seeing, I'm seeing uh, a 2015. 
with my with my implants. And I am been very, very happy with how my eyesight improved after cataract surgery. These folks did it. Little kid had hearing problems and had and had all kinds of fluid on the ears. They took care of this. Clip lifts, they took care of this. So these folks were very proficient when it came to surgeries and trying to help people through medical science. And of course, they had all kinds of civil technology. Look at the Mayans. They went through and built pyramids. Which brings us to another topic. Did the Mayans have contact with the people of Egypt? Now, the History Channel will have aliens flying around between both areas. I'm not going to go quite that far in my history class. It could be some truth in that. I'm just not going to dabble in that. That's, that's for them to be concerned with. But what I have discovered, guys, is that the Mayan people were seafarers. They built boats. They built outriggers. And you think about it. If you leave Cancun, you leave the you leave Yucatan Peninsula, you're not too far from Cuba. And you go to the shoreline of Cuba, and you're going to soon be in Haiti. Then the Dominican Republic. Then it's just a little piece across open water over to, over to Puerto Rico. Then from Puerto Rico, you go into what is called the Lesser Antilles. And those islands are all lined up down through Brazil and it ended with Trinidad. And you can sail to Brazil easily by following these islands. Or you could go southward along the coastline of Mesoamerica, Latin America, and make your way down toward Colombia and Venezuela and go across the top of South America. You can do that too. Once you get to Brazil and go around the Atlantic Ocean side of Brazil, it's not too far from Africa. You go across that open space, probably about a three or four week voyage across there, and then you're, you're on the west coast of Africa. You got people who live here, and they tell you what's going on around them. And you sail on up toward Gibraltar and go into the Mediterranean Sea, and all of a sudden you're in Egypt. And we believe that people came back and forth from both sides. Now, why do I tell you this? There's two reasons I tell you this. In the 1920s, when those British and those Belgians and all those folks of Europe went down to Egypt and started robbing all those all those pyramids and bringing stuff back to Europe, and bringing back those pyramids, bringing back those those uh, those um, um, oh the people in, embalmed, the mummies, bringing them back up here to 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 look at them and so forth. In those mummies, they found trace cocaine. Cocaine is only produced in one place in the world, and that's Colombia. On the other side, on the American side, the Native Americans believe that somewhere, somewhere around 1519, the early 1500s, a great white god is going to come back to see them. At one time, they had a contact with a great white god, and he promised that one day that he would be back to see them. When Columbus arrives in 1492, the people in the Bahamas and the people in Cuba, his first contact areas, believe that he is the great white god. When Hernan Cortez invades Teotihuacan, land, Mexico City of today, in the Aztecs, Montezuma, the, the, the king of the Aztecs, believes that Hernan Cortez could be the great white god. So this is, a, this is a folk tale, this is an oral tradition of all the Native Americans across the Americas, that one day a great white God will return to them and they will have a whole new way of living. Well, destruction is gonna be the key term here. It won't be a new way of living, it's gonna be total destruction that takes place among these native people, okay? So we know there's seafarers here in this time period. It's also during this time that the people of the world wanna find God. The Egyptians build the pyramids. Over the Middle East, you have the history of the Israeli people, the Jewish people. You start seeing the, the rise of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You start seeing the rise of the Christian church, the Jewish religion. The Islamic faith will come out of all of this stuff. Eventually, the Protestant faith comes out of all of this stuff. So Protestants and Catholics and Muslims and Jews and Palestinians, all of these folks come out from the same roots of Abraham. And then these Bible stories going to Egypt and so forth and being caught in bondage in Egypt and all that kind of stuff. And Moses and his laws are developed. You start seeing all this happening here, guys, in this time period. 
They're trying to find God. They're trying to find a way of worship. You're going to see Buddha. You're going to start seeing the Janus and other groups of people, guys, that are trying to find God, trying to find a way to coexist in this world. Well, the people in North America are no different. They started building earthen mounds to worship on. They built burial grounds for their leaders to be buried in. Down in the Mayan areas of, of Central America, down in, in what is now Belize and Costa Rica and Yucatan Peninsula areas, these folks here began to build these large temples. They made them out of stone. They started using hieroglyphics. They wrote books. They wrote down books of science and books of, and books of natural history. They, wrote, they wrote, wrote books about the calendar and about themselves. The sad part about it is when the Spanish came in here, they, they declared that all these books, all this literature, all these hieroglyphics were of the devil, and they destroyed them. They destroyed them. We had one priest, one little guy that brought a book back to Spain. He hid it. And that's how come we have the Mayan calendar. All the other stuff was destroyed. And you can imagine how much of an advanced science we'd have today with pandemics if we had the, the instructions from the Mayans and the Aztecs. There might be a cure for CV-19. There might be a cure for diabetes and AIDS. There might be a cure for cancer and other diseases because they spent thousands of years, guys, working on all this stuff. Our modern medicine is less than 200 years old. Modern medicine didn't really start in America until the Civil War time period, and it was still barbaric. It was still barbaric in World War II. It's still barbaric. Look at chemotherapy and how horrible that is to go through trying to cure cancer. It's a horrible way to try to cure stuff by poisoning the body. We're still not there yet. Maybe these folks had an answer to all this stuff, but the darn Spanish destroyed it because they're worried about Satan. They're worried about the devil. And they should have kept all this stuff. Okay? So these folks want a way to see the great father. Well, they decide to get high. Over in the, over in the southwest, they drunk cactus juice and all this kind of stuff and got high off of it. They put various kinds of berries in, that, in, their, in their drink, and they got high off of it. Here in the southeast, we formed what is called the black drink or the dark drink. This drink was made out of yopon berries. This is those orange berries you see on the side of the road in the fall. They'll be out here shortly. They're, they're green right now. They're going to be turning orange here in the next couple of weeks. First frost, they do get real orange. All right. They took these yopon berries, and they carried them back to the barbecue grills. And on the barbecue grills, they put big, huge, flat bowls, serving bowls, serving trays. And they put the berries on these serving trays, and they roasted them. After they'd been roasted and got real dry, they ground them up with their grinding stones and made a powder out of them. It looks just like a packet of cocoa or chocolate, chocolate milk, a packet of your cocoa that you're going to pour in your cup and add the water to it. All right. They poured this into their drinking vessels, and they poured hot water in it. They had their little stir sticks, and they stirred them all up real good. And then they had a pile of mistletoe. Mistletoe grows on the top of sweet gum trees. Mistletoe produces a berry that is highly toxic. Mistletoe is used during Christmas time as a place to kiss under. And I spent many an afternoon with a shotgun trying to shoot mistletoe out of, a, out of the top of a sweet gum tree to give my grandma a good, big, huge bundle of mistletoe to hang over her front door. That's where she wanted hung on the porch over the front door. That's a hugging place. That's a place to greet people at. And they took that mistletoe berry and squeezed the juice into that dark drink. And they drunk it. About Four minutes later, every opening in their body opened up. The whole body got dilated. They started vomiting. They had snot running out of their noses. They peed themselves. And they had terrific, horrendous diarrhea. 
And these kids, these 14 to 24 year olds who are trying to see God would have a hurling contest to see who could vomit the farthest. By the body opening up and getting rid of all this toxicity, it threw the kids into a trance. And for several days, they floated on a high. They got high, they floated. And in this vision quest, they're going to run like foxes. They're going to run like bears. They're going to run like wolves. They're going to soar like eagles. They're going to soar like osprey. They're going to swim like dolphins and manatees and sharks. These kids, these teenagers in the vision quest are going to, they're going to experience a supernatural world in which they touch the face of God. And once they awaken several days later, they got a story to tell. But oftentimes, some folks didn't wake up. They totally overdosed and they died from drinking the black drink. All right. There's a lot of good books here written by the University of Georgia and Alabama and LSU that discusses all this stuff. And if you go to the University of Louisiana, uh, you go to Louisiana State University Press, you go to the Alabama University Press, you're going to go to the Georgia University Press, you can find lots of books here that you can read and look at, order, and read about all this stuff. I got them all here at the house. I've taken several classes in Native American history so I can understand. I've taken classes in African American history so I can understand what's going on. I took courses in women's history. I was the only guy in several classes. You're the only guy with 45 young ladies in the class, and they're all picking on you because you're the only guy in there. But I learned more history in my women's classes than I did anything else, studying women's history. That's what I did at Florida State when I was going over there for a year. So y'all look at these books, and you can write them down and go to Amazon and order them cheaper from Amazon. And you can get paperback editions that are even more cheaper than the hardback copies. So y'all kind of look around and see what you can find out there. And of course, we have the encyclopedias for all the different universities across the country. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna sit down here the next day or two and put these university encyclopedias on the website, on the blackboard. So you guys can just click on them and go right to the encyclopedias. And that's gonna be one of my little jobs I'm gonna do here the next couple of days, get all them on there. I'm gonna do most of the ones from the Southeast, because that's the ones we really cover the most in this class. But I might add California's on there and some other states on there also. And I want to tell you something, of all the states, only about 30 of them have encyclopedias on the internet. And those 30 are mostly Southern states and the states in the, in the, in the, in the Southern, on the Sun Belt region. Uh, we're more histori historically interested than people in South Dakota are, or Montana or Wyoming or those areas, they don't do them. Uh, New England had some states that didn't do them in New England. I was really surprised. I thought those states would have encyclopedias also. But you can go there, guys, and find all kinds of neat stuff, too, in these state encyclopedias. And I'll get you all some connections to those here in the next few days. And uh, so you'll have them on, the, on Blackboard to look at. Okay? All right, guys. The Native Americans believe a great white God is going to come see them. They also believe in trying to see the face of God. The vision quest was common all over the Americas. They had various ways of getting high and having these vision quests. Okay. All right. You also are going to start seeing a major change in the economy. Around 2000 BC, 2500 BC, people start doing more traveling than they did before. They're farming, they're building their villages, and they're connecting themselves by the creeks and by the rivers, by the streams. Waterways become your major highways in this time period. Now, if you go to my Vicksburg site on my Facebook page, you'll see the evolution of transportation on the rivers. And it starts off with the canoe, and then with the raft, and then with the flat boats, on up to the steamboats. And it's a really good, they've had a really good little display area that showed the evolution of travel on the river system. And here you can go and see a picture of an Indian canoe and what they look like. If you go to the City of Mobile Museum in downtown Mobile, you will see a, an old dugout canoe they found up here in the Alabama River and brought it back down to the museum. And they use pines and they use cypresses 
to make their canoes out of, and the canoes are dug out. When a hurricane comes through, you have trees that are falling. They took their, they took their carving stones and they rounded off the, the, the nose and the tail of the canoe. They took the fire and they started burning out the inside of the canoe by chipping out the fiber of the canoe. When they got through, these big canoes had walls about four inches wide and the bottom was about a foot or so, maybe 18 inches deep. They did the bottom deeper so it'd be more buoyant. It won't turn over so easy. If you're carrying trade goods up a river, you do not want to turn over. If you're halfway to the marketplace and you lose everything, people get mad at you. You have all kinds of trouble. I want to tell you something. I have found canoes of various sizes. A regular one-man canoe, a one-person canoe, was usually about three feet wide. Usually about maybe 10 feet long. And sometimes you could carry a passenger with you in these single canoes. But I have found canoes as large as being 35 or 40 feet long and being close to eight to 10 feet wide. That's the same size of a cabin of a modern airline. You get a canoe that's 30 or 40 feet long and it's 10 feet wide, you can carry like 30 people in this canoe. If you put 15 folks on one side of the canoe and you put 15 more folks on the other side of the canoe and they've all got paddles, you make pretty good time on these rivers. When the river kind of teeters out and these canoes could float in three feet of water, when the river's kind of teetered out of the, of the, of the little, the little uh, branches or the little streams kind of teetered out, you'd pull your canoe by using vines across the land to the next river or to the next creek. And the Indians here in, in Northwest Florida, the Santa Rosa people who built pretty elaborate canoes would sail across the bay from Eden Park, Eden State Park, go across the bay, that's Port, West Port Washington, go across the bay about where, about where 331 Causeway is and make their way up to, toward the river, up toward the Choctahatchee River. They could go to Geneva and on up toward Hartford and then pull the canoes into the next stream and make their way up to Troy. In Troy, they could get on the Conecuh River and make their way to Tuskegee and then pull the canoe across Interstate 85 of today and make their way into Lake Martin, up into the Tallapoosa and Coosta Rivers. The Tallapoosa River would lead you up, to, uh, would lead you up toward North Atlanta and the Coosta River would lead you up toward, up toward um, uh, Huntsville. What you got up there, you're not too far from the Tennessee River. And the Tennessee River goes into the Cumberland River and all flows into the Ohio River, Mississippi River, and you've got a great waterway. And you pulled your canoe all the way to Cahoka from Northwest Florida. Out here in, in Western Illinois, across from St. Louis, this 200,000 200, person village. And here you brought your sea salt, you brought your pottery, because you fired your pottery. You brought your you brought your little balls that you that you made to, to heat stuff with, and you sold those too. You had all kinds of baskets that you made. You had various kinds of little furs from the from the possums and raccoons and rabbits and squirrels. You sold that up there. You had sea salt. You brought fish bones up there to sell as needles. You brought up there from Northwest Florida various kinds of seashells to use in their pottery. You see, the San Rosa people tempered their pottery. They discovered a real vast amount of red clay in the middle powder part of Walton County, just north of Niceville. They take their canoes across the bay, go to the Alaqua Creek, and make their way up the Alaqua Creek until you come to the hills in the middle part of Walton County. Bob Sykes Road is where this is located. Bob Sykes Road goes right through these red hills, guys. You guys want to go on an adventure in one afternoon, get out of the house and go do something? Go up to 85 out of Niceville and turn off on Bob Sykes Road and go to the reservation, and you'll come right by where all these folks gathered all this red clay up. And then you're going to soon be in the Funiac Springs and go around the lake yard and sell those, all those beautiful homes around the lake. These are all the old railroad homes that were built in the late 1890s. 
and then go from there on up 331 to Florella and go antique shopping. Then make your way back down through Laurel Hill and crash you and come back home. It'd be a great one day little trip. You find you some little places to go eat up here that you'll enjoy and get something different to eat for a change. Okay, so guys, these Indians went up here and they brought this red clay back down to the beach. And here they made their pottery. They put seashells, they put sand, they put Spanish moss, they put deer moss into the clay to temper it, make it stronger. They're the first Indian group in North America that put their pottery into their barbecue pits. When they cook their food, they put their pottery in the logs that's being burned to, to, make, to, to make your food, to cook your food with. And sometimes that animal fat dripped down onto these pots and put different designs and different colors on these pots. Here comes a whole new way of doing art, guys. And these folks did it. The Santa Rosa people were one of the first groups of Indian people, Native Americans, who actually fired their pots. You want to go see these pots? Go to, the Indian, go to the Indian Mail Museum in downtown Fort Walton Beach. They got them all there. They got them all there. And we're still finding them. We're still finding these pots. As a matter of fact, my first cousin found a pot over in Vicksburg at their hunting camp. They got a little creek that runs to their hunting camp. They just had a little flood down through there. And Janine and Robert got out there in that creek and went walking around, and they found a vessel, a little pot. It dated back to around 1000 A.D. Been that creek all this time. And they donated it to the Mississippi Archives. And so if you ever go to Jackson, to the Archives, you might see Janine and Robert's pot there on display. They gave it to the museum because if they wanted to keep it, they had to go through and pay some tax on it. And if they found it be cheaper just to give it away than to go through and try to keep it. And so they did that. So it's an interesting, interesting, interesting thing to look at here. So guys, they entered this great trade rec, rec, uh, network. Cahoka had a trade network that went from the Gulf Coast to Hudson's Bay in Northern Canada. It went from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to Southern California. And in this trade network are going to come the seeds. That's how corn got across the country. That's how potatoes got across the country. That is how tobacco and cotton got across the country. The seeds, tomato plants. Okay, all this is going to go across the country because these people have these great trade networks. The Natchez brought seeds in from Dallas and Fort Worth and from Kansas City. They brought seeds in from Nashville, Tennessee. They went up the river on their big canoes and they went to Cahoka out of Natchez. So these vast trade networks is what spread in communications, religion, politics, and it built an economy. I want to tell you something. These Native Americans had a great economy, guys. They had it going on here in this time period. They really had it going on here in this time period. Okay? When it came to manners, that's education. Your first schooling as a little kid was your manners. You learned how to get out of a high chair and finally get into the big boy chair or the big girl chair. And you sat there and mama put your food on your plate and you start learning how to eat using your manners. You learn how to say no sir and no ma'am and yes sir and, and no ma'am and yes ma'am and all this stuff. You learned your manners, all right? That's where it all starts here. That is your basic education. And in these early years, you learned your numbers and you learned your colors and you learned your sight words. That's where it all began. Education for Native Americans was based on oral traditions, is based on storytelling, based on their history, on their family history, okay? And so guys, they use this to train the new generation. And the major thing was to train these kids in the artisan arts, being a blacksmith, a cooper, making wooden, making wooden baskets, or making, or making baskets, you learned all these trades. And your family was known for the trade that you did, that you performed. And this is tripping to the 20th century. People were known how what kind of business they operated and what kind of what kind of they're involved in. And, and, and butchers were well known for being the best butcher in town. And you'd go see him, go get your pork chops, you know, 
you go see him to go get your hamburger meat. Because you know who the best butcher was in town. And this is true here of these people here. So you learned your, your work instructions, you had your religious instructions, you learned your family history, and you learned your manners and your social skills, and that was your schooling. And over in Europe, it's along the same lines. Only the wealthier kids, mostly boys, had a chance for a tutor, okay? Everybody else was left out. If you lived in a Christian, or you lived in a, in a village controlled by the Catholic Church, you'd have Catholic schools the kids could go to. But otherwise, your kids were not very well educated in this time period. Okay, so I want you guys to remember that. Storytelling is very important because it gives you your history. You know, one of my favorite stories is about, is about the Creek Indians of Alabama. The Creek Indians' homeland was destroyed. We're not sure what happened. It sounds like it was, it was the Mayan people. We know the Mayans went through a major crisis of some kind. We don't know what it was. It might have been a huge hurricane. They could have brought salt water onto the land and killed their crops and killed their agriculture. Salt water will kill the land. And a big, huge tidal wave comes across with a hurricane, a big, huge storm surge. It can destroy the land. It can happen. We don't know what happened to the Mayan people. But the Creek Indians said that their civilization was destroyed by a natural disaster. And they took their dugout canoes and made their way northward. Their story says they spent several months in water. I want to tell you guys, you could, you could have a peninsula that's only 500 miles south of here. If you get into a, an airliner and you leave out of Eglin or Pensacola, you build Yucatan in about an hour and 15 minutes. It's not that far down there. But if you're on a canoe and you're only going like 10 miles a day, it's a pretty good trip. And of course, your food source is going to be sushi, eating all this fish. You're trying to collect rainwater to make sure you have plenty of drinking water. And these folks said they traveled for several months across this vast ocean and made their way into a large bay. When they arrived, the bay was totally covered in fog. And when they arrived, all the sea life in that bay came to the surface to greet them. Every summer, about three times during the summer, Mobile Bay will lose its oxygenization and all the sea creatures come to the surface of Mobile Bay to get a breath of air. Okay, they call it a jubilee. The jubilee happens about three times each summer. The neat tide comes in and Mobile Bay loses its oxygen and these, 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 these sea creatures all come to the surface. And over in Daphne and Fairhope and on down through Baldwin County, they'll have a big, huge siren go off and they start hollering jubilee. And everybody goes to the bay in their boats and just go and just pick up fish and get up the oysters and the shrimp and all this stuff that's come to the surface. The bayway across the bay on Interstate 10 is called Jubilee Parkway. And these Indian folks said that when they arrived in this big bay, the fish came up to greet them and they fed themselves. About 10 o'clock in the morning, the wind came in and blew all the fog away. And these folks will name themselves the Wind Clan. The Wind Clan Creeks. They're going to go to the north end of that big bay. They go into what is now called the Mobile River. They make their way up into the Tom Bigby River and they make a left hand, I make a right hand turn up there, get into the Alabama River. And they settle just north of Montgomery, Alabama, where the Tallapoosa and Coosta Rivers come together and form the Alabama. There's a big old huge French fort up here called Fort Toulouse. That's another place you guys can go to on a weekend. Y'all go to Montgomery and tour the art museum and go to downtown and go to the Civil Rights Museum, go to the Shakespeare Theater, go to Old Town, Alabama, the old Gilded Age town up here they put together. Then going up to what to Watomka and go to Fort Toulouse and Fort Jackson. And then make your way up to Horseshoe Bend where the big Indian battle took place up there north of Talladega. It'd be a good weekend trip to do all this stuff, to experience all of this. 
we've got so much local history that you guys do not even know about. It makes me so mad because nobody has sat down in this county and done a good museum that deals with local history. The Baker, the Baker Block Museum does a pretty good job, but it's not top notch. Not the way it should be. And we got enough money, enough resources in this county to build a beautiful museum of local history. And there's so much of it out there that we could be teaching our kids and let them go on field trips and experiencing it and seeing it and touch and taste history. It's so important. When I go to places like Calgary and Atlanta and, and Memphis and Jackson and Mobile and New Orleans and Dallas and Houston, they're, they're great museums. I get so aggravated. I'm like, why can't we get modernized and have a great museum here of all this great history? So guys, here come the Wind Clan Creeks. Why do you think we have the Wind Clan Casino in Atmore? It starts all over the Wind Clan Creeks coming up across the across the across the, uh, the Gulf, making their way into Mobile Bay. The art of these people is functional. The art of Native Americans are functional. They did basket weaving. They made pottery. They had great architecture. They made their clothing out of furs and out of plant materials. They even had music. They used flutes. They used whistles. They used percussion. They would go through and take rattlesnake rattles off the tail of the rattlesnake and use that, those buttons, they would use that to, to get a beat going for their music. Then go get the cane and cut it into strips about, about yay long, about 18 inches long. And then go through and cut the fibers in between those connections and make a whistle out of it. They made a bird whistle and they used the whistle as part of their music. They took gopher shells and turtle shells when the turtles had been eaten or had died and they did eat lots of turtle. Y'all can get turtle down here too. You want some different to eat? Go get, get you some turtle soup or get you some fried turtle. Some of the restaurants here still offer down in down in Destin. It's a delicacy. And guys, they took the shells and filled them and put rocks in them and made a shaker. They made tambourines. So the music of the Native Americans is very similar to the music from Africa. When the African folks were brought over in slavery and they settled them in Georgia and the Carolinas. And these people got tired of being enslaved. They got tired of the cruelty. They ran away. And they made their way into the Creek civilizations and into the Cherokee civilization. And they were gladly welcomed. Native American culture is very similar to African, I should say, Native American culture is very similar to African culture. They blend easily together. And that's why you have African American Seminoles. And you had black Choctaws and black Chickasaws and so forth. And a lot of your African American families, when they do DNA tests, will find connections with the Native Americans here once they had come into the new world. You start seeing all this blending take place. Okay? So the music, the dance was very similar. They, you had the ring shout. They were, it, this, the, the music was used for, for self expression in dancing, they had storytelling through dancing. They have religious purposes through dancing. They had various kinds of ceremonies. The sports was physical sports. Who's the fastest runner? Who's the best wrestler? Okay. Who's the best of the ball game? Yeah, back around 1000 BC, the, the Mayan people discovered the rubber plants and they took the rubber sap out and they went through and they heated it up. They vulcanized it and they made what is called the ball. And they had plastic bottles and plastic shoes. They had flip-flops back here, guys, in this time period. Some two, some 3,000 years ago, they had flip-flops going on down here in, my, in Mesoamerica made out of the rubber. And the ball was created, and they created what is called the ball game. The ball game today is now called lacrosse. And so all this is being developed during this time period. When the Europeans bring in the horses and all this stuff, here comes horse racing and horse bulls and all this kind of stuff. All right? These people of Mesoamerica, the people of, of the Americas, had an advanced, complex material culture. They had a complex military, they had a, a complex um, material culture, which means, guys, they have homes with furniture in it. They got towels, they got bed coverings, they made, they made sheets out of the furs and blankets out of the furs of little animals. They made their fans to keep them cool. They made walking sticks. 
They produced musical instruments during this time period. These folks got heavily involved here, guys, with a complex material culture. In other words, they're starting to hoard. Here comes the problem with hoarding. All right. And so they are advanced to their advanced culture. When Columbus comes to the New World, they are living in what is called the Mississippian culture. The Mississippian culture was a culture that had evolved from these people or through these people in which they had a great civilization. They had their, they had their politics, they had their economy going, they had their vast marketplaces. You know, when the guys came in with Hernan Cortez into Teotihuacan land, the Aztec capital, these men were totally bewildered by the size of their marketplaces. They, these guys had been to Constantinople, to Istanbul, Turkey. They had been to Rome, to the big marketplaces of the world. They'd been down to Baghdad, the big marketplace down here uh, in, uh, in the Middle East. And they said in their records that they had never seen such a large marketplace than they saw at the Aztec capital. These people had great trade going on. If you guys ever get a chance and you go to the can go down to Cancun, go down to go down to the Yucatan Peninsula, I made a trip down here when I was going to school to Ole Miss, and I want to tell you something. That's the most fun trip I've ever been on. We went down to the Mayan ruins at Tulum. We went down playing at Playa del Alcamo. We went different places and had a great time. And uh, it's interesting. And the food was wonderful. And the food was cheap. I, I didn't pay over over eight dollars for any meal that I went to, that I, that I had down here in Cancun with some of the fancier restaurants and had shrimp and oysters and had all kinds of fish of various kinds. The food was just terrific. And the drinks were just like going to paradise. It's like going to a, to a, a faraway island and all these exotic drinks they had for us to, to enjoy down here. So guys, you get a chance, go down there and you can see what things look like in this time period and experience it. You can go on Google and Google the Mayan people. Don't forget, guys, on Blackboard, I got all these videos that you can watch, and it covers a lot of this stuff. So you can go through and see it through the videos, and I encourage you to watch a few of those videos. Y'all have 17 videos on the first part of this class. There's 60 videos total for the whole class. So you get a chance, y'all watch some of these little videos. And some are not, some of those are not very long. I didn't put some, I didn't put anything over like maybe two hours. I try to keep it down like to 45 minutes because your attention span kind of dwindles after a certain period of time. Okay, so between 1000 and 1500 AD, the American people are living in what is called the Mississippian period. It's a golden age. Society has, re has reached a zenith. Anything is possible here. Now I wanna give you the names of several Indian tribes that you should know about in this time period. The first major tribes are called the Southeastern tribes. The Southeastern tribes are called the civilized tribes. Okay, the first one, of course, are the Creek Indians of Alabama. The Creek Indians were in South Alabama, over into Georgia were the Creeks. Just north of them in North Alabama, North Georgia, into Eastern Tennessee, Western Carolinas, will be the Cherokee Indians, the Cherokee tribes. Just north of them in Kentucky and over in Western Tennessee will be the Chickasaw tribes. That's spelled C-H-I-C-K-A-S-A-W-S, -S, Chickasaws. It's spelled the way it sounds. Just below the Chickasaws, Mississippi, and over in Western Alabama are the Choctaws. Choctaws over in this region of the world. And then over in southwest Mississippi will be the Natchez. So you have the Natchez, the Choctaws, Chickasaws, Cherokees, and the Creek Indians. Okay? After the French and Indian War of the mid 1700s, a large group of Indians will leave Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Tennessee, the Carolinas to come southward as the white folks infiltrate on them. And these folks try to find a new place to live. And these mixture of Indian people, including African-American people, will make their way into Florida. 
and these folks will call themselves the Seminoles. So around 1790, early 1800, the Seminoles become a major player in Indian affairs. So don't forget about the Seminole Indians. So if I should ask you to name the five tribes of the Southeast, you got several of them left over. You got something that'll be left over. So you, you choose the, the five that you want to put on the question and you're fine, you're ready to roll, okay? So this is going on. The next big Indian grouping is called the Algonquin tribes. That's spelled A-L-G-O-N-Q-U-I-A-N. The Algonquin tribes are in the Ohio Valley. These Indian folks, these Native Americans will be infiltrated by the French and by the English. These Indian tribes become part of what is called the French and Indian War. Okay, the Southeastern Indians are mostly influenced by the Spanish. And from the Spanish, the British come in to infiltrate them. Okay, so you have the Spanish and the British and the Southeastern Indians, you'll have the, you'll have the British and the French with the Algonquin tribes. And then, and of course, these little sub-tribes include the Shawnee, S-H-A-W-N-E-E, -E, the Miamis, M-I-A-M-I-S, the Delaware people, and the Kickapoos. That's spelled K-I-C-K-A-P-O-O-S, the Kickapoos. Okay, and then the last major tribe is called the Algonquin tribe. And this tribe here is spelled I-R-O-Q-U-O-I-S, the Algonquin tribes, I'm sorry, the Uruguay tribes. And that includes the Mohawks, the Senecas and the Oneidas. The Mohawks, the Seneca, and the Oneidas. This Indian group will be infiltrated by the French, the Dutch, and the English. So all these three, these three different groups, the Southeastern tribes, the Algonquin tribes, the Uruguay tribes, are the ones we're going to be looking at here in this history class. Because these are the ones who are going to be directly involved with Europeans who are going to come in here and really upset their civilizations. It's going to change everything during this time period. Okay, so that pretty much covers our Native American history on this class and what all they had to do. And I want to do a little comparison and contrast with the people of Europe. And I'm, I figure I'm going to be through with this lecture probably in about uh, 40 minutes. And uh, y'all can stop it anytime you want to and go back to it and, re and watch it or whatever, pause it, whatever. So it's not so much to try to, to comprehend at one time. Okay, remember the people of Europe are patrilineal. Men control society. In the Americas, it's women who control society. In Africa, it's the women who control society. So the Europeans are going to, just, are going to figure through their white supremacy, their white male supremacy, that all these other groups are weak because they let women play major roles in their society. And the men would not hear of it in Europe. They kept the women down. As actually, they describe their ladies as being like children. They believe that women never grew up. They were still childlike. That's pretty insulting. All right. So women were totally put down by the European men. White supremacy, white male supremacy was a major factor here. Now, when the church, when Rome collapsed in 400 B.C., the Christian church tried to take over and bring stability to Europe. They didn't work out real well, okay? And across Europe during the time from 400 to 1000 AD, here comes the feudal system. That's spelled that's F-E-U-D-A-L, the feudal system. The feudal system brought in what is called the caste system, C-A-S-T-E. What it is, is one guy or one family who controls the work of hundreds of people. The feudal system, the caste system, is when one person or one small group controls the work of hundreds or thousands of people. The head of the caste system, of course, were the lords and the barons of the castles they built. The castles became a major part of European civilization during this time period. They built castles for protection. I want you guys to realize these castles were pretty good sized castles. Sometimes they might cover 500 acres of land 
and they built them up. Sometimes you have four or five stories in a castle. And like the Native Americans, they use earthen mounds to build the different levels of the castle, to build it up so they can have a, a, a very stable foundation on these castles. So you'd have layers that connected each other inside these castles, okay? Inside the castles, they had divisions of work. The aristocrats controlled everything. They're in charge of the politics. This is your lords, your barons, and all their big buddies, the wealthier class, the top 5%. They controlled everything, okay? They're also very devoted to the church. Church plays a role in the, higher, in the hierarchy of this civilization here in Europe. And of course, the head of the church is the Pope. So all these lords and barons look to the Pope for directions when they needed help. They looked to the church when they needed help people. Then you start seeing the evolution of kings. In 1215, in June of 1215, King John of England got his lords and barons together, and they sat down and they discussed a way to have good politics and a good society. And they wrote a document called the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta brought self-rule to England. And from the Magna Carta, you're going to get the parliament, both the House of Lords and the House of Commons. So politics, democracy is starting to evolve here from King John sitting down with his lords and barons trying to get a peaceful solution. I want to tell you guys something. These people up here in these castles were greedy. They were always trying to war against each other, trying to steal each other's castles and expand their empires, become wealthier. There's all kinds of warfare going on up here. And of course, in, inside the castles, you had the protectors who were the knights. The knights and the vessels. The knights were the ones who rode on horseback. They went across here trying to make sure the land was protected. They guarded the farmland around the castles. They also made war with other castles trying to gain their property. So it's a big mess up here. So you have the lords, you have the nobles, you have the knights, and you have the vessels. By the way, the vessels are mostly teenage boys. And their job was mostly trying to take care of the knights. And one of the big things was knights was knights were so bundled up in all that armor they couldn't go to the bathroom. And so they pooped themselves and they peed themselves and the vassals were the ones who had to go through and clean out the armor. Now that's a job I would not want to have. Coming off the battlefields and they're all stinky and you got to go through and help them get cleaned up and clean all the armor. I don't think so. So you guys go through and read about knights and vessels. It ain't so romantic after all. It sounds nice and it sounds romantic and all these demons in distress and all this stuff. Uh-uh, it ain't for me. It ain't gonna happen, okay? Then you had your yeomen. Your yeomen are your farmers. Yeomen are farmers. You need to remember that. You don't have yeomen all through this class. The yeomen were farmers. You also had peasants who worked the farmland. These were people who were freed, but they didn't have much to show for. In today's world, or in the world 100 years ago, we'd call these folks sharecroppers, okay? You had your tenant farmers. You had serfs, and sometimes you had slaves. A lot of Europeans would get slaves out of the Balkans. They'd go over toward, toward the areas of Russia to get darker complected people to be their slaves. And so you had a lot of people from, Austria, Hungary, people from uh, from uh, um, Georgia and uh, from Armenia and so forth that were enslaved here during this time period. Okay, then you had your artisans. These artisans are very familiar with the ones in Native America. You had your apothecaries, that's your druggists, that's your people who made your medicine. You had your bakers. You had your barbers who cut your hair. You had your butlers. You had your bow makers and your arrow makers. You had your butchers. You had blacksmith, candle makers. That's what you did you your house with. As a matter of fact, your, your, uh, your blacksmiths would go and make big round cylinders out of iron and they'd put prongs on them with sharp points on the end of them. And there might be maybe 20 prongs on, on a large, huge chandelier they built. And you pulled it to your ceiling with a pulley. You had a rope attached to the chandelier, went through a pulley, and you pulled it up to the ceiling, and you tied it off on the wall. You tied the rope off on the wall. 
Well, you lower down the chandelier, remove the old burned out candles and put new candles on those prongs. You would light them like a birthday cake and you'd pull them back up and tie them off on the wall and you had light until they burned out and you bring it back down again and start all over again. So candle makers were very important people. You had to have your candles. And the blacksmiths are the ones who made your, chandel your chandeliers for your houses. You had carpenters, you had cooks, you had gardeners, you had friars and you had ministers. You had money lenders who controlled the banking system. All right, you had guys who made pottery. You had scribes who took notes, mostly legal notes. The scribes is going to end up being a legal system. You're going to have shoemakers, and you're going to have you're going to have spinners, people who spin the cloth, mostly wool. Okay, the politics started with the pope, goes to the king, and it goes to the lord and the barons. Okay, these folks had advanced technology because they had draft animals. I mentioned this a while ago. With the horse and the cow and the ox and the mules, they were able to go through and make plows, wheel plows, they had wagons. They made various kinds of farming tools. Farming leads to technology. Farming leads to advanced technology, but there's a downside. With these people being agrarian, agrarian societies, they built their barns in their homes. You open the kitchen door, you go out back, and you, go, you enter into a barn. And that's how come they had these diseases. Smallpox comes from the horse. Cowpox comes from the cow. Chickenpox comes from chickens. You're going to have the flu, the swine flu, and the bird flu hogs and chickens. So a lot of your destructive diseases out of Europe is gonna come because these folks live with their animals. Native Americans, animals were wild. They didn't live with them. Now you might have a kid or two, might have a pet possum or a pet raccoon or whatever, that's common. You might have a little boy that went through and found a wolf cub and raised it to become a domesticated. That's not uncommon. But they mostly, the Europe, the, the, the American people did not have any kind of animals that lived with them. And that's why it kept disease away from these folks, because these animals were not present in their ways. When it comes to food ways, the Europeans want spices. The food is bland. They have all the different meats that I mentioned earlier, cows, the horse, the, the chickens, the hogs, and so forth. The vegetables. I mean, look at the vegetables. They had green peas. They had, what, they had what, what we call English peas. They didn't have the field peas, the black eyed peas, the pinto beans, or any of that stuff. They couldn't even make a good bowl of chili. I really feel sorry for them. These folks here in Mass America would put deer meat and chili and having a good time eating it. You know, it's crazy. They had artichokes. <sighs> Don't want that. They had cucumbers. They had chickpeas. They had celery. They did have carrots. They had cabbage, they had leeks and peas, the green peas, they had lettuce, they had garlic, they had onions and scallops, okay? Their herbs were mint and sage and cunin. They had parsley, they, had, they also had coleander. But they did not have nutmeg, they did not have cinnamon, they had those good spices from India that they wanted to improve their food here, okay? When it came to fruit trees, they had apple trees and pear trees and cherry trees and peach trees and fig trees and olive trees, and they had grapevines. North America did not have this fruit, okay? When it came to nut trees, they had hazelnut trees, they had almond trees. And then they had dairy products. They had milk, they had cheese, they had yogurt, they had butter, and of course they had eggs from the chickens. They had bacon off the hogs, okay? So these folks did quite well here in food ways, but not near as well as the people of North America had. And you see when these foods, these foods merge together and you start blending these food ways, you're gonna see a major, major change. I got a book here, I don't, I guess in my bookcase back here on the history of European, uh, the history of food ways. The book weighs like 15 pounds. It's a big, huge book. It was written in French and they, and they translated it. 
And I paid $100 for that book, but I wanted the history of food waste to give you guys more ideas of how these folks ate. You know, it's more fun to study cultural history than it is than dates and names and, and trying to remember all of that stuff, okay? Their economy is going to be based around farming, but these folks are not environmentalists. By 1000 AD, they have cut down all the trees across Europe. They've got to burn peak now for, for actual wood, or for actual materials to heat their homes, to cook with. They totally destroyed their farmland. One of the first things the Europeans did coming to the new world is they started cutting down trees. How did the Native Americans feel about that? They were horrified. These invaders who brought their diseases to them is now destroying the world that God has told them to protect. And they realized that their way of life is going to be, is going to be immensely changed because of it here. So by 1000 AD, the forests of Europe were all destroyed. That's why you have hedgerows and, and little vineyards and so forth in these French towns because they tore the land up. They got rid of all the trees here. That's why in the United States in the early 1900s that President Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, passed all these laws for environmental protection. Some groups want to go through and, and cover up the Grand Canyons. They want to go up there and, and, and destroy Yellowstone, Yellowstone and Glacier Park. And he stopped them. He started the National Forest Service and told the people, when you cut down trees, plant more trees. Don't go through and destroy your farmland. Don't go destroy it. Don't go through and destroy your, your, your timber, your woodlands. You got to have them here. The economy here in Europe involves vast trade networks. These trade networks transposed across Europe. They also went to Turkey, to Constantinople. And you also had the Silk Road that went out to China. And one of your greatest people who went to China during this period of time was Marco Polo. And he came back home and wrote a book about his travels. It's called The Descriptive Life of Marco Polo, or The Descriptive Journeys of Marco Polo. And he became very popular from here, okay? On these trade networks, you're gonna start seeing your spices. You're gonna start seeing your, your uh, cinnamon and, and your nutmeg and all these other uh, products here. Even sugar shows up during this time period, okay? Well, guys, the Europeans started these vast trade networks, but there's another group out here that's also just, is also making vast trade networks, and that's gonna be a Jewish people. In 70 AD, because of problems in Israel over a little group who call themselves Christians, Rome comes in here and destroys Jerusalem. They take the Jewish people out of Israel and they spread them all over Northern Europe. They're a fringe group of people. The Europeans look down upon these folks. And these Jewish merchants begin to build their own mercantile houses, their own merchant houses. And they find a way on the back roads, off the main trade routes, to find trade goods to sell in their mercantile houses. And the Jewish people become rich on them, become wealthy. Well, the church, the Christian church, the Catholic church of the time period, demands that all believers, that all the people of Europe should pay 10% tithe to the church. What, 10% tithe from everybody in the church? Well, guys, the Jewish people have anything to do with the Christian church. They're, they have their synagogues. They have their own, ways, their own places of worship. They have nothing to do with the church here. And here come Pope Innocents. Pope Innocence, in the year 1215, the year the year the year of Magna Carta, Pope Innocence tell the Europeans to get rid of their Jewish people, to flush out and get rid of your Jewish people, because they do not give a tax, they do not give a tithe to the church. And here comes racism. In the year 1290, the British monarch declares, and Parliament, declares that all Jews are not welcomed in England. And they flush these folks out. The Jewish people are all going to go, are all going to go to Spain. Spain is full of Muslims and it's full of Jews during this time period. 
okay? In 1394, 100 years later, the French expel their Jews. And they send their Jews also to Spain. Some go to North Africa, okay? And then in 1488, Spain expels its Jews. Well, guys, we got a brand new kingdom here in Spain. Isabel and Ferdinand have arisen to the throne of, of Spain. They are both are teenagers. Isabel is 17, Ferdinand is 16. They get married and they form what is called New France. They become the new, I'm sorry, they, they, they become New Spain. They become the New Spain of the time period. And these two teenagers get in with the Pope in Rome. And they bring the, the Catholic Church to Spain around 1488. It's a few years after they're married. And the church tells them that they should expel all their Jews and all their Muslims, all the people of Islamic faith, the people who thought of Mohammed, the competition between them and the European Christian Church. Well, guys, it gets crazy in Spain. They start what is called the Holy Inquisition. The Inquisition is going to bring torture and terror to the people of Spain who are not Catholics. They torture people. If you guys want to get a real idea of what takes place here, y'all read the lecture notes. Yeah, I give y'all great detail in what takes place here. They barbecued people. They disskinned people. They went through and they disemboweled people. They did all kinds of horrors to people who would not be converted to Christianity. The Holy Inquisition is going to come to the New World. It's part of the cargo that Spain brings with it when they start exploring. Okay? So, guys, racism is going to start here in, in Europe when they start expelling all these Jewish people. Okay? White supremacy is a major factor behind all of this. And remember, guys, that the Islamic faith, the Jewish faith, the Christian faith all came through Abraham. They came from the same person. You're going to be a little biblical scholars. Y'all need to read about Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, and about Ishmael, and Hagar, and Sarah, and all this stuff, and get that ancient, get that, get that early history here in this time period. Okay? Now, I want you guys to realize also the Europeans were the furthest ones behind the world, when it came to technology, the dark ages really stagnated Europe. The African people, the people of the Middle East, the people of China and, in, and the people of, uh, of India, the American people of this time period were all in the zenith. They were in a golden age. Their society was expanding and growing, but Europe was in a dark age. They were in squander. They were not doing anything. In 1069, Pope Urban, has decided the best way to solve the European problem and stop warfare between the castles is make all these people, all these warring people, come together as one great army. And he called this great army, the term becomes the Crusades. Bring these folks together and let them go and retake the city of Jerusalem. Take it away from Islamic rule. Why did the Pope do this? What's his reckoning in doing this? Well, it all started in 1046. In 1046, the people of North Africa, the Islamic people, the Muslim people of North Africa, came across the Mediterranean Sea and they attacked Italy. And for 45 years, they controlled the city of Rome. The Christian church, the Catholic church, was forced to flee and go to France during that 45 years. This is during the time of Charlemagne, he's the king of, the king of France, or the king of the, of the people of France. All right, guys, they put an army together, went back down to Rome, and ran all these Muslim folks off. So they figured tit for tat. They invaded us first. Let's go invade them and bring stability to the people of Europe. And off they go down to Jerusalem. 45 years the Crusades took place. We had 13 of them. They went down here and here they found the technology that they needed to change the world. You see guys, the people, the Islamic people had come in here around 900 AD. 
They built two great centers. They built a center of trade. They built a center of worship. The center of worship is called Mecca or Mecca, and it's still there. They still go to Mecca today to worship. Okay, Baghdad becomes the center of trade. Baghdad becomes the largest trade center of the world. It's larger than Rome and it's larger than Constantinople. And the people of Baghdad are trading in Russia. They're bringing all kinds of furs and all kinds of honey and other items out of Russia to Baghdad. They have gone to China. In China, they brought in the printing press. They brought in the gunpowder. They brought in the compass from China. They brought in silk and porcelains. They went through and built boats that were deeply hulled. They say if a plow can plow the ground, a boat should plow the ocean. And so they built these boats with deep bows and they put on them big, huge Leontine sails. They put one sailing mask up, they put on there one large sail. And they took these boats down the Tiberus River, got into the Persian Gulf, and made their way to Calcutta in a matter of weeks. And brought the spices back from Calcutta to Baghdad. And then they discovered over in West Africa, there's all kinds of cattle, there's all kinds of dried beef, there were cola nuts, there were all kinds of items they wanted. They had, they had ivory and they had gold out of West Africa. And so they adopted the camel, brought the camel into Baghdad, outfitted it for long distance trade going through the Sahara Desert. And they mapped off the desert. And to go across the desert, they used the stars for navigational purposes. They knew where the oasis were. And they made their way across the desert. They made tools to navigate the deserts here, guys. And the people of Europe are going to come home with this new technology. The deep hole frigates, the Leontine sails, the gunpowder, the compass, the printing press, and how to navigate by using the stars. They also found the lost learning they had lost. They had found their literature. Alexandria, Egypt had over 300,000 scrolls in its library. If you guys ever watch a movie called Alexander the Great, that was done several years ago. And y'all watch that movie. It starts off in the Alexandria Library. They start discussing what Alexander was up to starting with his childhood. And all this, all this history of Rome and the history of the Greeks and the Phoenicians and the Spartans and the Macedonians and the people at Troy, all this comes back to life again. And it's going to become a part of the, of the European literature. The Arabian Nights comes out of all of this stuff, okay? Chaucer in the Canterbury Tales is going to borrow stories from this time period. It all comes to life. And y'all should have read the Canterbury Tales by now in your English classes in high school, okay? Y'all should have read some Shakespeare during the same time period, okay? So guys, the Crusades brings in the lost learning and makes a renaissance take place in Europe. Here comes the European Renaissance, okay? So guys, you're gonna see a major change take place when all this stuff shows up. It's going to allow the Dutch to build sailing ships that can go for six months without stopping. It's gonna allow the Spain to build ships and use navigation to go from Pablo, Spain in August of 1492 to the Bahamas by October the 11th. It's going to allow the English to build all kinds of vessels to outdo the Spanish fleet in the future. They're frigates that can turn on a dime. The Spanish are going to build big, huge ships called galleons to carry cargo, and they're big and slow. And those English boats can take advantage of them and make war against these ships and plunder from the Spanish Navy. So, guys, the world is reinvented when the Europeans bring all this technology home with them. That's why I'm concerned about technology today, guys. You've got to make sure your technology is not stolen by different groups. 
Look at this internet technology and in presidential elections. People trying to interfere, trying to interfere with the election process. You see what's going on here? You got to be careful about your technology and make sure that you don't just go and give to anybody, or anybody's going to give somebody else in, in exchange here. Okay. With the Renaissance come the university system, and across northern Italy, Milan, and 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 Bologna, and these these different cities, they're going to start building universities. The University of Paris shows up pretty shortly after the Renaissance starts. The University of Berlin. You'll have Oxford and Cambridge in England. You'll have St. Andrews in Edinburgh, Scotland, that opens up during this time period. So you start seeing a very expansive growth of education during this time period. And people start having their kids educated, either through a tutor or from homeschooling or through the church. So they can go to these one to one of these great universities during this time period. Okay? So I want you guys to remember that here with education. Music comes into play. And here comes musical notation. We start having the language of music here in this time period. Here come your pianos, your harpsichords, your, your air pumped organs are being developed during this time period. Here come your work songs, your patriotic songs, your hymns. All this starts evolving here, guys, during this time period. Dance in Europe becomes centered around folk fans, dances, folk festivals. All right, self-expression, religious pageantry. Y'all know that dance brought in the Mardi Gras during the high, during the Middle Ages, or I should say, during the Renaissance time period. The church wanted to carry the Christianity to far-flung villages, and so they built elaborate floats that told a story. Noah's Ark, you know. They had the story of Abraham and Isaac being on, on the mountaintop where, where Abraham's going to go through and sacrifice Isaac and God stops him to test Abraham's faith. You have the story of Jonah and the whale and all these floats had scenes on them in which actors portrayed the story to the people. And this begins what is called Mardi Gras. Of course, Mardi Gras now don't have any church Bible stories going on. There might be a lot of nudity going on but, and craziness going on, but they don't have the storytelling as they used to have on the old Mardi Gras floats of time before. Sports involved horsemanship, foot races, farm work, and, of course, wrestling. Wrestling's been around ever since the beginning of time, and we're still watching that dang wrestling on TV. It's really crazy here, guys. Okay? And then, of course, you have your literature. The Arabian Nights come out during this time period. The story of King Arthur and the poems around, around this. Dante wrote the Divine Comedy during this time period. You start seeing the Canterbury Tales come out during this time period. And all this is going to lead up to a big, huge conclusion with Shakespeare in the 1550s and 1560s. In the, in, the, in, the, in the Elizabethan period of England, you're going to start seeing all this play a role here. And then in the 1460s, printing changes. Johann Gutenberg is going to invent a press that has movable type. Publishing becomes a lot easier than trying to carve out a wood block to be printed. And here he's going to start printing Bibles. One of the first, the first things he starts printing are Bibles in Latin. The people of Europe cannot read them. The churches in, in Europe are all Catholic churches, and they're all being read to through Latin, and they don't understand what's going on. It might be a beautiful service. There might be some entertainment in them. It may have some great songs to sing, but as far as theology is concerned, Europeans were clueless. The church controlled the secrets of theology. Here comes Martin Luther, a German Pope, I mean, a German uh, a monk who decides to go through and write the Bible in German to let the German people have a chance to decide on their own what their Bible tells them. And through his research and through his writing, he finds 95 falsehoods of the Christian church, 95 false teachings. And he exposes it just like Michael Snowden did. And just like Daniel Ellsberg did with the Pentagon Papers, this man exposes corruption in the church. And from this exposure comes what is called the Protestant Reformation. Here comes a new church that's designed around the new theology. 
the truth of the Bible, not the falsehoods of the Catholic Church. And Martin Luther brings in the Reformation, and here comes the Protestant churches. Here comes your Methodists, your Baptists, your Presbyterians, your Puritans, your Quakers. All these different groups are all going to come out of this Reformation of Martin Luther. And he exposes. And remember, guys, 1517 is when it all took place. And 1517 is where Spain is expanding itself across the Caribbean. And all this new theology is going to come across the Caribbean here. And people... Who cannot, who cannot make it in Europe because they are Protestants will try to come to the Americas to form a new society based on their church. So a lot of your explorers who will come over will come over because of that reason. Okay? Well, I'm going to conclude class now. We've got a lot of stuff covered. When I come back and I do the History 2 lecture, I'm going to start off discussing how the church changed the exploration of the new world the role that England plays in all this stuff. And then we're going to start discussing the explorers and, the, and, the building the, and building the different colonies. And I'll have that lecture done here in, in a few days. Okay, y'all have a good afternoon, a good evening, and I will see y'all later. Thank you for watching.